there's 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 really two types of politics, right, in the world. There's the politics of power, and there's the politics of distribution. Politics of power is about the politics of figuring out who is going to dominate the other. And then there's the liberal world. The liberal world is a world where we all agree that there is this thing called the rule of law, that it is supreme. We all agree that we live within that common fabric and within that common fabric, you know, we are able to exert freedoms. The fact that we now are sitting here thinking about what are the possibilities available to me and what are the obstacles to those possibilities, be it the government regulation or taxes or, um, or, or foreign policy arrangements, recognizing that like the fact that you're even having that conversation is because you're breathing liberal air. Good to see you, Mike Brock. How you doing? Yeah, doing doing good, man. Although, uh, you know, we've got a studio in London now. Do you I know need, about I this? Need, I, yeah, I, want, I yeah. need to come see it. Yeah, you've got to you've you got to come see it. Uh, some, turns out I have some time on my hands. I can probably there make you that go. happen. Come down, take some football. Uh, I um, I don't not, not I don't like not being in my studio now. There's a familiarity to being in your own studio, your own chair, your own surrounding, and it it I think because we um. We were a homeless podcast that roamed around the world recording in Airbnbs. Once you get a studio, the it becomes part of you. But I gotta say though, like with your whole get up here and the tattoos, you look you look you look like you're right at home here in LA. Well, yeah, I know. I love it. I told you this last time I was here. I, I LA is a weird place in that there's so much wrong with it, but I fucking love it. And I there's always an energy here. I think it's because it's a creative place and I'm a creative. Yeah. Uh, I always like coming here and I, you know. My plan today is once this is done, I've got a walk. I'm staying in uh, Santa Monica. I'm going to walk the full walk down to Venice, see all the crazies down there, and walk back. And I love it here. I could I could live here, no problem, apart from the taxes. <laughs> those taxes. How you Not been? The taxes. I've been good. I mean, you know, you know, it's it's been a uh, it's been a year of transitions for me. Um, so obviously, I'm 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 not in my previous role anymore. Uh, I, I've, I have uh, moved into a new chapter of my life. That you started a sub stack. I started a sub stack. I'm going to see where that goes. Well, look, that's going to be the framing for the conversation today. Let me tell you where I'm at. So I am really trying to spend a lot of time understanding why the political discourse has got so bad because it is terrible. And we also, alongside that, we have, uh, I think we're living in the most fragile time I've existed, mm-hmm. whilst having so much amazing shit. Mm-hmm. Like, we've got amazing technology, and, and, mm-hmm. and but there's so many crazy things going on. It's a paradox. On. Yeah, it's, it's a weird one, right? And so I, I started writing. So you pinged me the other day on Signal, and you're like, oh, I've written this article, let's read it. And I was like, huh. It's kind of similar. I, I feel like you're, you're at least in a similar space to us. To mm-hmm. me, and what was it? This is fucking serious. Mm-hmm. You wrote and this I'm, is fucking serious. This is yeah. fucking serious, and mine was called sausages. Um, but I'm in this place where I've rejected the political system. I'm out. I didn't vote in the UK elections because I knew whichever party I voted for, I was voting for decline. Mm-hmm. So I'm not. I'm refusing. You don't want to be. You don't want to participate in the the managed decline of your nation. I don't want to vote for decline. Okay, and so. What I'm now in—that this- makes sense. Yeah. I don't. I don't want to vote for the decline of America either. Um, I'm, I think I'm, you have the I'm, same choice. I am committed to its ascendance. I think you have a similar choice next month. Though I think you will. Any vote is a vote for decline. Well, we'll talk about that. Yeah. Well, we'll get to that. So anyway, so I, I'm my headspace at the moment is in my little part of the world. Is there anything I can do to contribute towards the reversal of decline? Mm-hmm. So, what that means is. I'm reading a lot. I'm started writing as well, and I'm trying to think of ideas, ways, means to be part of something that reverses that decline. Because, God, it's a big rambling opening, but it's set in the scene. Revolutions often come from a divided society, and often come from it's pre- prerequisite. Yes. Yeah, it often come from like a wealth divide, a growing wealth divide. Yeah. 
a uh, bourgeoisie and a proletariat. Yeah. Um, and I feel like we're heading towards that. I, like, I see I see the symptoms. I'm like, what can I do to be part of that? So that's where I'm at. Mm-hmm. Um, I've started writing another article. Okay. Where, and again, we can talk about that. Where I've, the, the title of the article is, The Libertarians Need to Step Up. Oh. And, I'm not, and I'm not saying libertarianism is the sole idea. Mm-hmm. But I think libertarian principles within the current political framework yeah. are part of the solution. So that's where I'm at, Mike. Yeah, that's I, all yeah, of okay, it. Okay. All right. That sounds like a... One more thing. We can go deep today. And, <laughs> and the reason I wanted to talk to you most of all is I, I obviously get to talk to lots of libertarians and I obviously get to talk to lots of Republicans. But I feel like the most important thing is talking to the broad spectrum of people so you understand where they're coming from. Yes. And so I know you are a Democrat. Functionally, yeah. Functionally, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't consider myself a partisan. No, like you won't see me uh, trumpeting Democratic Party propaganda. You won't see me um, being in a, uh, engaging in apologetics for them, selling their policies for them. Um, I am not a member of the Democratic Party in that sense. Principles, um, <laughs> but if 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 what you're asking is, um, am I functionally? driven towards supporting the Democratic Party's candidates such as they're presented to me on my ballots right now? Yes. I mean, uh, 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 in, in to the extent that I um, contribute money uh, to uh, political organization in this country, um, I view the Democratic Party as the currently only viable vehicle available to me um, that seems somewhat coherent with my understanding of um, the the liberal society that I, I, I believe is my inheritance um, that was built up over several hundreds of years, starting in a, uh, in a revolution in this in this country um, that that brought our forms of government into a bit of a uh, disunity. Um, as, we, as, uh, as we as we Americans and Brits like to joke with each other about. Um, but I, 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 I recognize that um, in the what, what I would say the healthy politics of distribution, which is what um, look, there's, there's, there's really two types of politics, right in the world. There's the politics of power, and there's the politics of distribution. The politics of power, is about the politics of figuring out who is going to dominate the other, who is subservient to who, who has the power, the raw Nietzschean power, the will to power world. And then there's the liberal world. The liberal world is a world where we all agree that there is this thing called the rule of law, that it is supreme, that and this even includes your constitutional monarchy today, which has largely adopted these ideas, especially in the 20th century and the post-war era, Um, this idea that everyone, I mean, obviously it goes back to the Magna Carta, but it was an imperfect document. But I mean, at at, at the end of the day, um, we all agree that we live within that common fabric and within that common fabric you know, we are able to exert freedoms that we wouldn't be available to us if we were all just like on our own as roaming bands in the wilderness, looking out for ourselves, um, trying to have bandits not like steal our food away, you know, from us. That yes, we give up certain things um, as Thomas Hobbes and, his, you know, and, and the Leviathan uh, um, famously made the argument for this idea that, yeah, like we, we are actually more free as humans than we would be if we were living in our state of nature by, by giving civilization control of certain things, giving away some of that personal freedom to the state. Um, and obviously John Locke, the, the, who, who in many ways was once again, the, 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 these are all people of, of English and Scottish liberty, um, inspired um, uh, Thomas Jefferson, who wrote the Declaration of Independence, and this this idea um, 
uh, metastasized into this this liberal civilization, which has seen um, an advancement in in human progress that is incomparable to anything that human history had ever seen before. Like even at the heights of the Roman Empire, those were achievements that spanned thousands of years, but these are achievements that we were able to undertake in the span of a few hundred years, most of those achievements in the last third of that um, uh, trifecta of centuries. So recognizing the importance of that, the, 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 the sheer beauty of that, that, and and um and my belief that if there is to be a world worth living in in the future um at least in in my conception of it um that i can understand that 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 that, that the path to that is through the continuation of these ideas um most importantly that there is something that's bigger than all of us. It's at the very least, if it's not a God, it is, it is, it is society and the civilization which you are connected to, that you came from, that you inherit your spoken language from and your written and in, 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 in all of your cultural references from. Um, and you are you are part of that. You can't separate yourself. You're not, you're not this separate entity that existed out like you know, you aren't some roll of the dice. I could like to imagine sometimes I could have been someone who grew up in India or China or Africa. It's like, no, I was, I was a, a man uh, that was born in the suburbs of Toronto, Ontario, Canada. And the very fact that I'm sitting here championing, championing the, um, what I see as the virtues of, of, of English liberty and the liberal tradition um, is, is very much contextual on that. I was, <laughs> I'm was i living in a former British colony in the shadow of, of, of the, American, uh, the American global order and its media that, that embodies these ideas and, and created this, 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 this liberal cultural fabric, which is, I think now has actually made, I think, I mean, I... I I don't know if you think about it this way, but I feel like more and more like Western Europe, Canada, the United States really just seems like the same people to me now in a way that it didn't before. Um, there's a familiarity. You know, when I'm in Germany or some or Germans are here, there's something about the way we go about our business as a Western society of, of these of this of this like liberal culture that even if we have disagreements between some of our countries on like various social policies or economic policies, there's still a through line there that's very familiar. And I think that's been really hyper accelerated by American media, as in some ways has homogenized the Western culture. Um, and and I think that's probably a good thing. Um, but I also think that people are misunderstanding something that the fact that we now are sitting here thinking about what are the possibilities available to me and what are the obstacles to those possibilities, be it the government regulation or taxes or, um, or, or foreign policy arrangements, um, recognizing that like the fact that you're even having that conversation is because you're breathing liberal air. You're breathing liberal oxygen that you're even sitting here trying to engage in the politics of distribution, not the politics of power. Because once we start talking about the politics of power, this all goes away. This all goes away because all of these rules are just rules and rituals that we follow every single day. We get up out, uh, we, we, like there's, there's nothing, there's nothing forcing us. So Se separate the politics of power, politics of distribution. Mean can they coexist, or is it is it an ongoing fight? It's an it's an ongoing fight, obviously. But what we tried to do with the liberal revolution is we we figured out a few things, right? The American Revolution uh, was the first attempt at politicizing this idea that we need a system of self government, which means that we need to distribute power. We have, and we have to, and we have to make, we have to create, and, and we know that power is always going to compete for power. 
So what do we do with that? Well, let's create three co-equal branches of government that all, in theory, have the same equal amount of constitutional power, and each one of them can't do anything without the other two. And let's make sure that these bodies are assembled through different processes. So it makes it really, really hard for one singular entity trying to organize across all of these different areas of power of the government. So they this 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 was their like and I mean and that's where you get right the 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 famous uh, the, you know the famous uh, quote right you know an, an American republic if you can keep it they were they they weren't sure like right the the founders of the American Revolution were were actually in some ways quite skeptical it would all hold itself together they were quite skeptical that the forces of populism wouldn't and corruption wouldn't consume it well the forces of corruption have consumed it that I would say is. I don't. I don't think. To, I don't think. To argue I, I don't think. I don't think that. I, you know. I'll, I. This is probably going to like shock people on all sides, but I don't think we're at a high watermark uh, for corruption um, in the United States or or even in 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 the UK. Compared to what? I mean, I, I think. I think if you look at our history, I would say that the the, the post war era um, in the United States was a highly corrupt time. It was highly corrupt. Like a lot of like the, um, uh, like the amount of 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 crazy like backroom deals that had been done for the war effort. Uh, you know the the the, the war economy stuff had led to all of these like re- you had all these regulatory agencies that had like all this power, and there was a whole bunch of like you know like it, it was it was a very corrupt time. Like the regulatory state in the United States, as it was also in the pre Thatcher era in 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 the UK in like the sixties and seventies, was a was a clusterfuck of corruption and um in the case and in the case of, of the UK, right? Like this is pernicious, like pernicious labor unions like themselves, like very, very corrupt organizations, um, which are like extracting rent um for their own like political power. Um there was a story of that recently, wasn't yeah. there? Yeah. The guy driving the Bentley in the big house. Yeah. Exactly. I mean this is this this is I don't think we're at a high watermark. I think we're at a high watermark for understanding the nature of corruption today yeah. because of our our social media, because of how many eyes we have on it. I think, I, I really strongly believe this. If we were to put today's eyeballs on, say, the administration of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, for example, in the, in, in the Great Depression heading into the World, World War, like the New Deal era, Right, um, these these massive expansion and big government. Um, I mean, I think we would have found like if we had enough if we had enough wherewithal. I think the the, the scandals we would have found the um, the 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 frauds that went unanswered, the the phone calls that that powerful people made at the FBI to to look the other way. I think I think you'd find that stuff, and I think it would be quite outraging. Um, so I think we've made this sort of epistemic error um, by looking at our society now and now having a more total picture of what's going on and seeing some of the, I mean, look, and by the way, like, like the, the, I know that we hate, like to hate intellectuals now, but I mean, like, look, I mean, just like, just, just go and like read like Nietzsche or like these, these guys and like, and, and the things they were saying, it's like, all these things, all this, all the, the political corruption and, and all this stuff, like the elites, stuff like that, it was all happening back then. And like the intellectuals were talking about the exact same things that we're sitting here between like, you know, two very sophisticated condenser microphones in a very beautiful studio in, in, in Los Angeles, like talking about. But like, these are not new things that we've been competing, uh, or sorry, like contending with. Um, because look, human society is messy. There's competing interests. When those interests are competing, there are different people will will go to different means uh, to have their interests served. Um, some of them will pass beyond what we might consider criminality. But then there's some, and then there's some argument on the other side about like how just far are we going to enforce the law or not? Like, like, and and hmm. these these are all a big complicated interplay of features of our society that have been playing out. And and so I am in some ways simultaneously 
more optimistic, but also like much to your what you were saying before around the strange paradox of our times, that living in a world of such plenty and opportunity and um, at the height of our of, of our existence in, in every material way, seemingly teetering on the brink of our own destruction. I am definitely worried about those tail risks, and I think they get bigger by the day. Yeah, I'm an optimist as well, actually. I've, I've been come an optimist because I force myself to be an optimist because if you see a problem, you don't do anything about it. You've got to put your head, you've got to put your head on the line. You've got to try and make change, be the change you want to see. So I'm an optimist because I'm searching for solutions and finding them. But I think there's been a normalization of corruption. Yeah. Um, I've, there's, yeah, so many things like here in the US, the, I think it's worse here in the US than in the UK. Um, that every single senator who earns $170,000 a year is worth $300 million and lives in a giant house and mm. is very good at trading stocks. Mm. That, to me, is a normalization of corruption. Um, and the vast growth... At, at, least, at least it has the appearance of impropriety. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, no, I mean, I'm, I'm not saying it's not corrupt. I'm just saying that there's, like, the, the point that I would make there uh, is that when you hold an office of public trust... Um, appearances are actually quite important. It's part of your obligation to society as a respect for that office to present yourself to society in terms of your own personal actions as as something that looks more like a role model um, to society. So even if it just so happens that person has a really good wealth manager and they um, like completely just like subjugate all their decision making to them and it just so happens that their wealth manager is like really good. I mean, you need to, you need to consider like maybe maybe it's just better to put something into a blind trust and ignore it um to prove to people that like that 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 there's no impropriety there. Like that that's so what I'm saying is actually in support of your argument I'm saying even if even if those people aren't actually corrupt, even if they just so happens they just some self selection effect that they're that they're going to be more successful in their investments they have an obligation to like go overboard and show us that that's not what's fucking happening or government has a uh, duty to legislate so they can't yes um but that's just examples but the you know the military industrial complex yes. and the endless wars the, endless the pharmaceutical war. industrial complex the prison industrial complex all these industrial complexes uh, I mean, just even, some of the things that I interviewed a guy yesterday who was, um, uh, he's got a program about wrong, uh, uh, works for uh, people who've been wrongfully convicted of crimes. They estimate two to five percent of people in prison have been convicted wrongfully. And he was talking about this time in prison. And uh, it would be $20 to make a phone call, to make the call, and then five cents afterwards. Mm. We know in a free market that, that phone call doesn't cost $20. Mm. Uh, only one supplier of goods in, I can't, what do they call it? The commissary? Well, the place where you can buy stuff in jail, the, the, the little shop. Oh. The commissary? The commissary? Commissary. Commissary? Yeah. I can't remember what it's called. He was saying there's only one supplier. He said everything is vastly more expensive than externally. Um, and, and then if you work for the, uh, the, the in, within the prison, you get paid 25 cents an hour. Like all these things are just, to me, just exploitation and yes. corruption. Yeah. And I mean, that, 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 that passes a smell test for me of, of describing something as, as corrupt. And, well, and it gets worse because the, the, the problem with the prisons is a, a large number of them are the backbone of small towns where they exist. They, they're the, the yeah. majority employers so of the prison yeah. guards association yeah. actively lobbies so, against reform yeah, in the so, prison system. This is, all, this is just the corruption of man that exists everywhere. Yeah, well, I mean, it, but, but this is where like I would say the, the, you're just describing political economy. This is what political economists think about, right? Yeah. Um, which is the the way in which all the interests come together um, to uh, form a coherent whole in our society. And so, yes, like when you look at something like that from the perspective of political economy, I agree with you that it's corrupt. There's corruption of a kind. But then, as you've already started to note, once you start to tease that sort of a corruption which exists at the scale of political economy um, apart, what you realize is you got a whole bunch of fabric of people in between and neither of them are individually corrupt. They all entered into contracts. They all went through job training. They 
you know, are uh, they're they're paying their kids through school on from the the employment that they're gaining um, from all of this. And at the end of the day, and this is the this is actually the delusion of the right wing populist today, that there's actually just like one cabal of people that are sort of steering this ship. It's not true. Is it true that people think that? I think so. I think so. Like because when you talk about things like draining the swamp, um it it, even like the, the thing is is like we've already started to to, to tear at the threads here of like the reality of the swamp. The swamp isn't just government bureaucrats. It's the it's 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 the the people at the at the the bangers and mass shop that the bureaucrat is going into because if that bureaucrat goes away, their bangers and mass shop in 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 London is going to go under. The political economy is basically reaches all the way around us because we're part of the society we all like we, we we interact with it through our individual choices through our uh our, our polit- political relationship or the nature of power relationship that we have with the state um but we can't escape these interrelationships so we can confuse ourselves at a, 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 we can confuse ourselves into thinking that um the corruption is merely a creature of government or it's merely a creature of a particular group of elites that go to Davos, Switzerland once a year. Um, and, 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 and there could be like some truths to that in the sense that, um, these are people who, who, whose careers are about keeping the system stable, which by the way, actually, like I, I would say like to remind and maybe we should talk about today. I could just openly talk about what my politics actually are. I know we touched on that when you mm. asked me if I was a Democrat, but I'd well. Let's um, let's finish yeah, on this. Um, yeah, but 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 um, but from this perspective, like yeah, like these these are people. Their incentive is stability. They want tomorrow to be a little bit better than today for them and their companies and their interests, and that makes sense. And, and there's nothing pernicious about that. But if you're on the outside looking in. Um, and you see uh, these breakdowns of, of, of political economy, like the one that you mentioned there, and that, um, and you look at that, and you're like, well, because they want stability, they're standing for the status quo. Therefore, they're defending this corruption. But then I think things get. I mean, I, but, but then I think what you rec- recognize too is that when you go and talk to that Davos crowd about that aspect of corruption. They probably agree with you at some level that we should do something about that, right? Like it, they're like it, it the, but but their inability to have the outrage that you have is tied to the fact that if they were as outraged as you, their entire company would be on fire, and uh, and and they'd be laying off tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people. From their vantage point in the political economy, they have to prioritize stability. And that's going to inform their political decisions. So people are like, why, why, are, why is all of corporate America like mostly supporting Kamala Harris? This makes no sense. She has more left-wing policies. Like, what is this, woke capitalism? No, it's not woke capitalism. It's what I just said in the political economy of things. These are people whose instincts are to pursue stability. Of course, instability for them is potentially life and death for a company. That it's on the knife edge of a for, of, of 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 profitability, um, you know, based on its access to foreign markets and distribution and supply chains that could be that could be impacted by sudden shifts in foreign policy, radical, unpredictable shifts. If you look at say something like that, you look at someone like Trump, who is is um, holding up his mercurialness as a, as a feature, right? The madman theory of foreign politics. You might look at Kamala Harris's like talks of price controls and and shit and be like, well, fuck, that's like not the kind of world that we want to do business in. But the other this instability that this other guy represents, we don't even know what's coming. At least we can sit here and like get our 
think tanks going and and start like trying to like, get our lobbyists like convincing the politicians on Congress to like water down this fucking price control proposal. We can do that. We know people. We can make phone calls. I I, I went to I went to college with this guy, right? Like um you can imagine how in their minds they're like, yes, like we have no fucking problem standing behind Kamala Harris because that's the way that they're viewing it. They're not viewing it as like we want to like protect some corrupt status quo. They're looking at it from like, I don't want to wake up every day with my whole fucking company on fire because Trump just started another fucking trade dispute in Vietnam. Like this, like, like, like this is this is the way they view the world. It's not through this like like when you see like political commentators like talk about like how like it makes no sense like that that um it, frankly people like myself who's econo- like uh, my economic views quite honestly probably code what people would say in the United States are center right ish like i i am like pretty positive on the existence of a social welfare state but i also think that um, I want very pro-business policies, like low regulatory environment. I'm pretty pro-free trade. Like, um, uh, You're a classic liberal. Yeah, yeah. Um, and there are things that like Kamala Harris and the Democrats like currently support that I think are, well, I mean, actually in some ways I've been surprised uh, by some of the policies that she's prioritized. Like for instance, like her YIMBY policies, the yes in my backyard policies as a, as a, as a counterbalance to um, the what we call a, a nimbyism, right? Um, this 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 absolute opposition to building housing. Um, the fact that she's talking about federally enforced permitting reform um, uh, and and land use reform, I mean that tickles my classical liberal funny bone um, because I think it's like probably the biggest more than any of the inflation that we've had for anything else. The the run-up in housing costs over the last 20, 30 years in this country, which were rising at, like, in even in the back in the Bush era, were rising, rising at, like, 10, 11, 12% per year. We didn't, like, watch this housing shortage creep up on us. And that had, and, and that just meant that the, you know, 40, 50 years ago, people were spending, like, a quarter, maybe a third of their income on housing. But by like by even the, the 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 heights of the the boom times of 2019 uh, under Trump, right? That had risen to 50, 60 percent of of the average person's income. And sure, things felt like they were doing good back then, but we haven't noticed how the biggest tax that Americans have paid has been to their landlords because they operate a housing cartel where they keep competition out. They don't let developers build. So the fact that Kamala Harris has made uh, disrupting that and 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 forcing land use reform, um, I think is actually from even my kind of more center right economic views, it's pretty important uh, from a matter of salience and the impact on on the average American. Um, I don't think I, I don't see any of that coming from the the. Um, Whatever, whatever is happening on the other side, I'm not. I'm not even sure that that man is is, is fully with it these days. But like, I don't. I don't think he's um, uh, proposing something like that. Um, so, I, I don't. I don't. I, I just don't see these things in the in the contrast that it just seems like so many other people in these conversations are seeing them, which is in this very reductionist, um, really old old school way of thinking like there's the socialists on the left and there's like the conservatives on the right and there's like this and and the reality is is like none of these distinctions make any fucking sense anymore like i like like I'm, why not because they were largely um irrational conglomerations of a whole bunch of series of like different views like it, it's like it's an accident of history that um cultural conservatism and like and free markets found themselves married together um and i think the only real reason that happened was because of communism and because of the fact that the communists were atheists um and that was in some ways what a lot of cultural conservatives in the west actually originally objected to in fact there was people don't recognize sort of the slow evolution here like you go back and i mean herbert hoover the Republican president, um, when the Great Depression hit, he wrote a book 
criticizing capitalism. I mean, go go on Wikipedia. Mm, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, yeah. Um, um, so I think that like uh, conservatives used to be very skeptical of capitalism and free markets because remember conservatives care about cult, cult virtue, like like you know what people engaging in prostitution or, or, or doing like, you know, like repugnant or vulgar things. Traditional like, values. Yeah, traditional values. And capitalism was just an opportunity for the more libertine elements of society. And you saw this in, 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 in the early 1920s. The conservatives of the time wanted nothing to do with free market capitalism. It, it was in fact like the, the, the liberals, the sort of the, um, the, what you might have said was the center left back then. But you've had so many shifts in yeah in uh, political culture. But I think we I think we're back there again, largely. Um, I think what we would describe as like the center left today, to the extent that there is support for um, in this. I know there's people screaming at us right now through the screen or their, or their headphones as I say this. Is really the only like like serious game in town for free market capitalism. What uh, is? Uh, what what we what we might call like the center center left aspect of the political spectrum. Well, you, you're gonna have to explain why that's the only um, because it you. is it is the only. I mean, even though it, I wouldn't say it's exactly uh, a place for laissez faire ideas to flourish today. Um, it's certainly uh, a political space that's very much preoccupied with with reining in what it sees as the excesses of economic power. Particularly the um, uh, the the rise of of the social media companies, um, really really large powerful multinationals that that um, seem to have more bargaining power than entire governments, um, has 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 is, has led to that um, that space not necessarily being very friendly to a hands off approach. Um, and I and I think for good reason. I, I think th I think there is dangerous excess here. Um, but what the reason why I would say like this is the only game in town if you're a free market capitalist is because if you're a free market capitalist, you should really care about the rule of law and impartial courts mm -hmm. um, for like commercial disputes. You should really, really care about a stable political system that's going to have predictable results. That when the that when the when the regulation gets passed, you may not like it, but you know how it will be enforced, and it won't be enforced based on that per that bureaucratic loyalty to the current president or the or, or, or the current ideology once we start doing that the system really starts to break and I would say that right now and like this is like much to my chagrin like I I think the Republican Party's destruction and and, and it has been destroyed it has been destroyed the party of Lincoln has been completely destroyed as an institution, as a functional institution, as a failed state of a party. Um, How? Because I think there will be uh, conservative people who say exactly the same about the well, Democrat Well, you know what? Party. Like in another era, I was like I, I am, in, in some ways, I am a like a secular conservative, like of the center, like of like I, I'm not like like I think uh, like a conservative liberal. If you will, not not a social conservative. Like I'm, I'm like I'm. Don't worry, everyone. I'm classic, like, you're classic liberal. I, 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 you can go back and look if you don't believe me. Um, but I was actually a very early advocate for same-sex marriage, for example, um, even when I was associated with conservative politics, um, because I was always on the secular side of things. Um, and those people still exist. A lot of them are have been have been have been have been, have been named on, neocons now. Why, but like, why why has the Republican Party been destroyed? Because because it was um, some it was, it polls was, at the moment are saying the Republican Party is about to win another election. Quite significant polling data yeah. shows that. So how how can a party that's been destroyed? Or do you mean that the ideology has changed? The, it's not the ideology. The party's not functional. It's just it's 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 Trump and MAGA. And and like the Republican machinery is still being used, 
Um, but it has essentially been disassembled and uh, it has been taken over by members of the Trump family. It literally is being run by members of the Trump. You sent cool. members of his family into the RNC after he secured the nomination earlier this year and promptly began redirecting Republican the Republican National Committee's funds towards paying for his criminal defense um, uh, in, uh, the th in, in the three cases that, that special counsel Jack Smith had, 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 had brought against him. Or sorry, sorry the two cases he'd brought against him and, and the third in, in Georgia. Sorry, that's a state case. Um, and that was the moment I think that the Republican Party died. Like it died at that moment, right? Because if it was a functioning political party, then uh, the party would be not read it, it, it has to elect like uh, member like you know uh, local politicians at the at the city and the state level uh, district court like district court elections district attorneys general they they they, they elect the the Republican Party is, is is responsible for getting tens of thousands of various officials across this country elected into various like levels of office um, and they the the machinery of this party is not has never has not designed nor should it be fully designed for the uh disposal of just the, who happens to be the current presidential nominee or the president so are you basically saying the republican party has become its own authoritarian dictatorship yes i mean i mean I, I, the, I, the party doesn't exist anymore as an institution like it's gone. Like I mean, like How, the legal seen... documents are still there, but like it, 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 it has like the, 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 the establishment that, yes, the establishment of the Republican Party that was its binding function that brought it all together that like kept things sane has been removed, and the Trump organization, its family members and its acolytes have been sent in to run it, like. I don't understand how the, the structure of these parties traditionally work. I don't understand how the DNC works. I don't understand how the Republican Party works. Well, I mean, it's a... I mean, what happens... What, what are the backdoor corridors of power, traditionally? The humble bee, a keystone species crucial to the survival of Earth's inhabitants. Here's how things would look if bees vanished. And here's how they'd look if humans vanished. But imagine if instead, we became a keystone species. By doing things the right way. By taking responsibility for our actions and becoming the solution. Iron Mines, the world's most responsible currency, the right way. Because the future depends on it. Yeah, I mean, like, uh, traditionally, the parties are, are are very powerful organizations. But what, what is, is there a board of governance for yeah, a party? Yeah, yeah, you have, the, you know, the Democratic National Committee is, like, made up of committee members, and there's there's ways in which, you know, uh, the party, like, comes up with ways in which those 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 members are are chosen uh, the, the 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 current like leader of the party like be it like a, a sitting president or like I, I don't know what all the crazy rules are but like whoever like is seen as most senior like might have some like appointment rights but like at the end of the day um, it's not meant to be a dictatorship of a single person. There's many interests. There's sometimes there are dis even disagreement within the party. You've got like candidates, you have more centrist democratic candidates who are running in red states that don't necessarily buy into the same progressive policies that a that a democratic candidate here in um uh California buys into. And the party has to be able to like reconcile both of these differences and be able to like put the party machinery up to get them both elected. Um, Whereas in the Republican Party, Trump has removed all that. It's not there. In fact, in fact, like the, the, the you, one of the things that I think um, is uh, an undertold story uh, going into this election uh, in the next three weeks 
is how they destroyed their get out the vote infrastructure or the RNC. They gutted it. Explain what that is. The get out the vote, get out. I mean, I mean, you have. I mean, it's the same thing in in the UK or 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 Canada or any any other country. Um, that has elections is that one of the one of the important functions of a, of a political party is to make sure that the the voters who are voting for them get to the polls and vote. That can be everything from calling them. That can be everything from like knocking on their doors. It can be to offering them a ride to the polls for like the for the you know somebody who maybe is disabled or something. Um, and so you get volunteers um, to, to to help people to help people vote. Um, and the party creates really sophisticated infrastructure. They, they, they put a lot of emphasis into knowing who their voters are um, and who their committed voters are. Um, and then sending out volunteers to target those people and make sure that they get their ballot in the ballot box. So both the DNC and the RNC like traditionally have like pretty sophisticated operations that work with like state and local parties um, on, on election day to like coordinate all this. Trump's Trump went in there and he gutted all of this. He defunded all of this from the RNC like earlier this year. How does that benefit him though? Should he wants people well, out there. Well, I mean, he. Well, I mean, you're you're talking about like you you, you act like like that that he thinks more than one step ahead. I mean, you at the but time. But I don't understand what what's the benefit because he, the benefit to him is people out there voting. Yeah, I mean, he. I, I just don't think he. I mean, this is why you have Elon Musk right now, like trying to with this America pack trying to. Because Elon Musk has figured this out, um, that that Trump just completely gutted the RNC's get out the vote operations, and so Elon Musk is camped out in Pennsylvania right now, yeah. basically trying. He's going on tour. Yeah, he's basically trying to uh, orchestrate a get out the vote um, infrastructure in these past few weeks to compensate for the fact that Trump just completely gutted this operation. Is this election coming down to Pennsylvania? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, I think, I think, I think, I think. I, I think depending on which way Pennsylvania goes, so we'll go the election. I think that that's that's a pretty safe bet at this point. I mean, there's there's. Um, Are you following Poly Market? Yeah, um, <laughs> let's have a look at the latest thing. I don't know what I think about that, but um, well, I was discussing it with Danny yesterday. Here we go: Poly Market, uh, Trump, Kamala election, because it's. Here we go. Because it's different from the polls. Presidential election winner 2024. Here it's way go. different from the polls. Yeah. So although it does it, you know, the the predicted market, which is the an American domestic market, Americans can't actually use poly market. You know this, right? Hmm. American citizens can't use it. It's 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 not uh Well, you can with a VPN. Yeah, well. And that's pretty simple to do. Because UK people can't use it. Yeah. But you can with a VPN. Um, there's there's no uh, KYC. Yeah, I mean, um, betting markets here are. I've got like Kamala Harris at at forty eight, um, and uh, and Donald Trump at fifty four. Forty I mean, fifty two. Do you mean? Yeah, that's fifty. I mean, but here it's got it. So it's got it. Uh, him at sixty point three and her thirty nine point eight. The math doesn't need to add up. But I, I was chatting to Danny about this. I I said, poll to me a poll is asking people who they're going to vote, and that will give you an accurate percentage. Yeah. But if you see the polls that Trump are winning, uh, uh, I don't think a betting market is necessarily going to reflect that. A betting market that thinks is a bit more convinced that one's going to win is just going to swing towards that. Yeah. And so I don't see it as a... I think some people are looking at going 60-40 on poly market and thinking, well, Trump's, this is a landslide. I just think the betting directs towards... What the polls are saying, yeah. So, um, I mean, look, what, what would your Republican friend say to you about the, the Republican Party essentially being dead? And look, I recognise that. Look, for anyone getting angry about us having this conversation, just listen. Um, there, there are uh, Republicans against MAGA as, as, as a group. I follow it on Twitter. I'm intrigued I mean, to see what they say. Almost all of my Republican friends agree with me. Okay, at least in private, even if they won't come to like vote for Kamala Harris, like they. None of them are voting for Trump. None of my Republican friends. They're just either not voting or they're doing something silly, like write in a candidate. Um, but um, and most of them don't live in places where it matters anyway. Right. So they're Republicans in yeah, blue but, states. Um, but I mean, among my Republican conservative friends, of which I have many, because I've 
I trafficked in those circles when I was younger and carried some of those friendships into adulthood. I mean, I don't have anyone that like actually thinks that like Trump is, like is a good choice. Like uh, um, that these these new converts like David Sachs or Elon Musk or um, like any any Bill Ackman. Like, I mean, my theory is my theory. Um, we should just go there. Why don't we just go there? This will make the conversation more interesting. Tell at me this your point. theory. Oh, I think they. Let me tee that up with just by the way. Since <laughs> I've become uh, politically inactive, uh, one of the best thing the outcomes of that is being able to see with clarity because the the, the inherent bias people have means, and I've done it, but I probed people from either side. Uh, if I like in the UK, if I probe a, a Labour voter on the performance of Keir Starmer in these first hundred days. They're very defensive and you know, and, and, and will leap to say, yeah, but the Conservatives did this. And so it, it kind of ranges between defensiveness and whataboutism. Um, and if I probe my Conservative friends, they're very direct attack on um, the Labour Party and you know, very defensive of... Uh, to the point whereby I, if you did a blind test with a, with a, with a p- policy... That was by both sides. You blind tested it. I believe the, the, their views would change depending on who the party is proposing the policy. Yeah. It's it's become bullshit. So it's you it just becomes easier. You have like you have these this almost like these X ray specs. Just but we, we we can look at this though. I mean, like Gall- I, Gall- Gall- Gallup. Gallup and, and Pew do broad-based opinion surveys of the American population every single year. You can look at this, where they go into every single fucking like opinion that anyone could have on basically anything, and they try to get a pulse of like where Americans sit on various things, everything from marijuana decriminalization or legalization to um, their views on like transgender issues. Um, and obviously, there are some like divergences here, but I mean like. You you essentially have overlap um, in terms of policy agreement by sixty to seventy percent of Americans on virtually everything. Um, levels of taxation, how much should the rich pay? Like, what should like you know like like should we give like poor people money? Like all these other things. Like you essentially have this like actually really robust. If actually everyone just sat around and did it, a really robust sixty to seventy seventy percent center that seemingly can agree on, like, most things most of the time. Yeah, but, I mean, we all know this. It's the loud minority that control this. It's the loud minority who are the extremists on each side that drive yeah. the debate. They create the majority of the content. They create the talking points. They create the arguments. They're, act- yeah. they're activated by the political parties themselves. You're, you're, you know, we have things we agree on. You're de- I think on some a lot of issues, you would generally be more progressive than I, I am, and certain things I'd be more conservative. What do you think? What I mean, now that I don't, now that I can speak openly about it, like let's just 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 throw it at me. I'm curious. I, I don't know until we went through the the topics, but let me let me just say okay. what the point I'm trying to make is, even 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 if we had somebody who who wasn't even conservative on economics, mm-hmm. you know, a proper woke lefty, I bet if I could sit down, we could discuss the issues and. And, and kind of come to some kind of rational con- conclusions, things that mm-hmm. we agree on. Yeah, I mean, to the point where they, they, this this other article I've got coming out, where I'm like telling the libertarians to step up. I said, can we just some, gr- agree on some foundational things that we all want? I think we all want. This is the basics: a strong economy. I don't think anyone disagrees with that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> okay. Yeah, I mean, we we all want lower taxation if we can have it. Okay. We want reduced poverty. We want less corruption. We want good healthcare and good education. I think. It doesn't matter. Use that word "good" a lot there. Well, yeah, but but like but better. the definition of it. Trajectory I mean, wise, you want every one of those to go in the right trajectory. I don't think on any of those, unless you're there with a the full Marxist. I think pretty much you sit down with whether somebody's a libertarian, mm-hmm. a super woke leftist, a super conservative right wing person, and you said to them, "Do you want a stronger economy?" Both would say yes. If you, they would all say yes. If you said, "Do you want better education for your for your children?" I think they would say yes. If you want cheaper, better healthcare and better healthcare outcomes, yes, I would want that. I think we do. You want more security? Mm-hmm. Do you want a better rule of law? I think we all agree on that. And so the point is, I think we kind of all want the same things. The argument in politics is how we get there. 
Most people do. Most Some people, people do. do want power. Some people do want to dominate others. Some people do. Yeah, but but just those, their relationship of their ego with the world around them is is not in a healthy place. But that that's the action. What I'm saying is the yeah. policy. The, the, what the outcomes? I think mm-hmm. everybody wants pretty much the same. I would go higher than this. I would say ninety five percent, ninety nine percent would agree with those. Yeah, it's how you get there. In that, maybe a conservative party say we would we need to get there by more but, deregulation yeah, like, and lower taxes. Whereas uh, uh, the lay uh, like uh, in the Labour Party in the UK say we need to get there with higher taxes and more regulation. Yeah. but they're trying to get the same outcome. And the truth is. What we need is objective, intellectual uh, 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 answers for how we get there. Yeah, that that means we can't. We, we can't. We policy. can't. We cannot have that. You're, you you want to have a conversation about the politics of distribution while we're sitting here having a conversation about the politics of power. Yes, and the problem is once we're talking about the politics of power, the politics of distribution is all academic. Like we just don't. We don't have. Like we're like. I mean, and, and you ask, like, like there's no, it's not hard for me. Like, I, I, I proudly voted. I already, I did my mail-in ballot two days ago with my wife. I voted for Kamala Harris and, and Tim Walls. I voted for the ticket, even though it doesn't matter. I'm here in Los Angeles. She's going to win this state and all of its electoral votes, votes handily. Um, with no reservations. None. Yeah. Why? Because uh, what you just said that most people want the same things, even if they want to go about it different ways. I believe that about Kamala Harris um, from from watching her. I believe that she generally wants the same things as me, um, even if I disagree with her about how to go about that, and of which there are substantial disagreements that I'm, um, I'm not at liberty to get into right now because I'm not going to help Donald Trump do his job. I'll be more than happy <laughs> to speak more openly about my misapprehensions about like about about her policies um, once like I'm not having a conversation about the politics of power in this country because Donald Trump is a not a good person. He is clearly only out for himself. He clearly only cares about himself. He literally went to a memorial service for a dead man. Um, that was supposed to be a somber affair and danced to the village people's YMCA. I don't know any details of in this. Front, in front of the, like this man is a narcissistic sociopath and it's not hard to see that this is true because he has not shown an ounce of empathy in his entire life. And so even Actually, if- Actually, I saw a bit of that. No, it's funny you should say that. Did you see him on the Theo Von podcast? I didn't actually. It's- I tell you what, it, there was something in that that surprised me. He went on Theo Vaughn's podcast, and Theo talked about uh, when he used to be addicted to cocaine. Yeah. And oh, the, I, I did see this, yes. And the way Trump spoke to him and asked him about it... And he, was, he was curious about it. Curious and empathetic. There was, there was a curiosity there. Yeah. Um, but I still, I, look, I, this is going to sound uh, flippant and flagrant and... Uh, I don't. I don't trust him. But the thing, I'm the, sure. I'm sure that he had a real curiosity there because, as people know, that Donald Trump has been afraid, very afraid, his entire life of mind altering substances. He does not drink alcohol. He is afraid. Yeah. He is afraid. Um, um, is he I, afraid? He just doesn't. Just has not I, interested I, in it. I, I'm not. I'm not sure. Um, but I imagine. I, ima- I I could imagine someone like that who um, has avoided uh, mind altering substances his entire life, um, getting pretty curious about um, someone's experience on no. On there cocaine. was there was an empathy to, to his voice. Maybe. It was a stranger. But but the the point you make there about him, I don't give him much credit. I don't I don't give him much credit. <laughs> well, sorry. This is so me able to me sat outside of this one. I don't have maybe a horse. unfairly. I don't have a horse in the race. I can't vote in the U.S. elections. Yeah. If I could, I don't actually know where I would. I possibly. I wouldn't vote for Kamala. It's I don't. I probably still wouldn't vote at all. To be honest, I probably wouldn't vote because it's still yeah. managing voting for decline. But the things. Why you do you think? Why do you think that's going to drive us into decline? Uh, why do I think? Yeah. Because I do, I think you have a root issue of corruption in in, in the U.S. system. Mm-hmm. You have a root issue of debt. Mm-hmm. Uh, MMT doesn't work. Despite what Stephanie Kelton you, you, says, you think you think you think the government's currently practicing MMT? 
I think I think they think they are. I think parts I of them think they are. I don't think are. they think that. I think they think they're fucking following like Chicago school monetarism badly well, right e- now. E- I think e- that's what they think. Either way, th- th- neither nobody's proposing an answer to deal with the massive issues of spending, debt, inflation. Yeah. Nobody nobody's proposing any of that. No that's one true. Yeah. And so well, well, I mean one of one of these one of these proposals is going to accelerate our our um our decline into debt by on the order of five magnitudes if you want to go by what the western what what the Wall Street journalist not hardly a left-wing politician that compared the economic impact of Trump and Kamala's stated economic policies. 60 what looks like the 63 percent of economists including the wall street journal editorial board all came to the conclusion that kamala's economic policy was going to be far less damaging for the united states's fiscal trajectory than trump's well, yeah i don't know I, I don't even know how to trust these things anymore Did, didn't 50 53- these are this is fucking conservative yeah but didn't 53 uh ex uh fbi and cia uh uh employees state that the uh, hunter biden laptop board all the hallmarks of Russian disinformation. It did. It, yeah, but, the, but, but it, but it, it wasn't. It did. It was bullshit. It did bear those hallmarks. Yeah, but it was bullshit. It was bullshit. It was, it was simultaneously, it was simultaneously his real laptop. It was simultaneously um, what it appeared to be. And it was also a Russian misinformation op that was meant to try and 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 and, and use it, you opportunistic oppor- there there like i am 100% convinced by the way that both of these things are true at the same time i totally understand like the the journalistic Sorry. and uh editorial mistake that twitter made um in in suppressing that story and building it and 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 and, and honestly that's actually why the Russian propaganda was so fucking effective in our system because that is actually what 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 Ru- the Russian uh, Russian influence operations in our country are aiming at. They're not aiming at trying to convince us that the Hunter Biden laptop is fake. They're trying to get us to show that we're hypocrites, that we're corrupt. Look how stupid we are. Look at how the left overreacts. This is actually the reaction that they're trying to get. No, so, Mike. Mike, we can't do this one. Listen, we can absolutely. You. I mean, so, this so, is this is this is exactly what's happening. Yeah, but listen, if if, if the laptop, this is exactly what's happening. But if the laptop is real. Yes, it's, it's, not real. Proper, it's not propaganda. If the story is suppressed, it can both be real and propaganda. How how can how can something be real be propaganda? The the story is true. The laptop was real. The story was suppressed. Let's back up for a second. Back up the for story a second. So, suppressed. So, so I get it. So like, I mean, this the 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 story uh, on this this ha- the Iranian the Iranian hackers apparently stole all of this. Um, information from the Trump campaign that we currently know that journalists are currently sitting on and don't want apparently don't want to uh, uh, irresponsibly publish because I'm, they don't want to interfere with the fucking election. No, I'm serious. Like I want to. No, I just want to like like really dig in here a little bit because there is a crazy amount of fucking hypocrisy. Yeah, hypocrisy is fine. On, on, on this. Hypocrisy is fine. On this. Like this, this, the sense, like, you know, the very same people right now that would be fucking outraged if whatever those dossiers of information that the Iranian hackers have put in the hands of journalists who have yet to, maybe they'll publish them between now and, and election day, but so far they have chosen not to for reasons I don't understand. Could you imagine like what like the the populist right and and people would be saying if this was was 2020 and the 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 tables were reversed yeah but, but, but they, mike, it, it would be like hunter it would be like it would be like the hunter biden laptop times a million yeah but mike that's that's what aboutism it's not, just, what, it's not it, what about ism. Yes, it's what about this. It's over not here. what about ism. You need to ground yourself in like what is what like, what the fuck are we actually talking about here? Because like look, the the, the I get it, like it is crack addict son. Um, in like probably I don't know what what he was on like walked into that fucking store like high on meth or whatever he was fucking doing and like forgot that the fucking laptop was there and like left a whole bunch of like fucking videos on it of him smoking fucking crack and all that other shit and honestly if I was a journalist that happened upon that like you know, a few weeks before fucking election day in the middle of the fucking COVID crisis and everything we were going through. And we had a president that was like talking about like fucking like putting bleach in us to like wash fucking COVID out. And also knowing that like the, the like that, like 
that yes, like there is just like happened in 2016 with the Comey email thing that turned into nothing, but many people, including like Nate Silver, believe probably through the election to Trump. Like, would I be like a little bit hesitant uh, to just basically put it out there and be like, you decide America. Like, like, I mean, like, like what, like what the fuck are we talking about? Like, like trying to like basically like say that this is like, 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 like obvious like corruption. Um, I did cor- well, the, and, yeah. and yet, and yet, and yet, we're sitting here with like journalists like doing whatever the fuck they're doing to try and be responsible about this like Iranian material that's hacked that like no one's talking about that we know that they're in possession of right now. Like, 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 like. So, like, what the fuck? Like, like, wh- which which way do you want it? Like, is is that corrupt? That those documents haven't been published? I don't know the details of that, so I don't know anything of it. I'm just dealing with this. Again. No, but no, if you're going to start with this principle that like the public has the right to know Mike, Mike, and they have the right voice. to make up their own minds and like nobody has the right to like basically like gatekeep and fact check first before like basically irresponsibly putting something out there that could potentially be Russian disinformation. Like we don't know. We haven't checked. Like we haven't got our forensic experts on the fucking laptop. It's kind of convenient that just a few like that, 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 a, that a few weeks before election day like i'm just i'm not trying to say that like that was right that 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 was right i'm simply trying to say that like if you're in that position it's a completely reasonable thing to think that like maybe this is like russian disinformation like it has the, like you said like the hallmarks of it and and i honestly think that it it probably was somewhat that in the sense i i think the republic i think the i think, the I, think Ru- they knew. I think the russians helped it along i think the russians helped along Giuliani finding that fucking laptop. Maybe. But the the laptop... Uh, look, I, I, I'm, I have no horse in the race. This is the point I'm trying to make. I have no horse in the race. I'm just trying to say... I, I don't even know how we got here. It's from a number of people who said a certain thing. <laughs> um, the point I'm trying to say is, is that it's so hard to know what to trust or believe anymore. It is yeah. so, so fucking difficult. But I have no horse in the race. So I just see it all. The arguments you make about... Uh, Trump, I could equally make them about Kamala. I could e- make equal ones about her being a narcissistic sociopath who, who's only interested in power. I could make the same. I mean, I mean all politicians yeah, that exactly. are successful are somewhere on the narcissism scale. But like, do I do I believe that she will put her own interests above everyone else to the exclusion of others? No. I mean, I look at I look at her relationship with her family and like the people around her, and then I look at the relationship with Trump and, and the people. He 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 doesn't even have loyalty. Look, at, he doesn't even like one of his own daughters. Like they like he, he won't even like look at her. He's like embarrassed by her and like broad, broad view. His wife won't hold his fucking hand. You, you've seen all the videos of her him her slapping his hand away every single time he tries to hold it. This does not seem like a man that um, is good at putting others before himself. But this so, is this conversation. I just, this idea that they're both equally the same kinds of narcissists. Not, and no, they but seem, we don't need to measure. It's just crazy. I think, crazy. I think what we're doing right now is we're contributing to what I see as the problem. No, we're not. We're, well, we're we living are. in fucking reality. We're living in reality. We have choices in front of us. And like the reality was is that like, look at John F. Kennedy... Junior, like you know, the, this this exalted like leader, and and he deserves, I think, the the part of the the, the credit for being the, the most powerful normative storyteller of America in the post war era, um, at least up until like Reagan, um, at that time, uh, and you know, like he was also like a a corrupt philanderer like like we know like he pro- his family had like relationships with the with the with the mob with the mafia like we know that like we know that we know that those like connections were there it wasn't a completely clean family that there was shit going on right his he had his brother as his like uh attorney general right like in the in one of the most like nepotistic relationships like i think that if you were to get underneath J, JFK and some people have and and people don't want to look at it because they want to have a very Pollyanna view of of JFK and for good reason he said so I mean his 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 inaugural speech when he was first sworn in right they asked not what your country can do for you but what you can do for your country right like that was that was the line that set the stage for what would come afterwards. You know, his, his famous his famous speech, right? Uh, uh, calling to to land on a, a man on the moon, and return him safely to the earth. 
um, uh, you know, we want to we want to remember that, and we should want to remember that. But he was also a deeply flawed man that that was surrounded by personal corruption, and he was like fucking Marilyn Monroe and cheating on his wife. Like we like like like, like we know that like like it, it, it's like I, I don't know why we've convinced ourselves that we didn't have bad choices in the past. And there were just some choices that were less bad than the others because unfortunately the realities of power are very brutal. They're very brutal. If we find our way back to Hobbes's state of nature, we are going to struggle to find our way back and hopefully we'll be alive on the other side. So we've always had to make these moral compromises We've always had to do that. And we've always had to be like grown up about it and be like, this is the world I live in. It's not the world I want to live in. We all aspire to better. But by the way, that is part of liberal culture, by the way. That is, that is part of the liberal oxygen that we breathe, this idea, this pretense that we have that, 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 that things should be better, that this isn't right, that, this, that, that our sense of fair play is like, like, like we actually have our own yardstick that we can like measure ourselves and others against constantly to the point where people like you using those yardsticks get justifiably cynical about all that, that corruption that you see and then you don't even want to cast a vote. And then you have me over here telling you uh, as the infinite pragmatist that like, yeah, you really do want to contain the damage because if we're going to turn the ship around, it's going to be a lot easier to turn the ship around if it has less damage than it's going to have on this other path. Now, I don't necessarily think that, uh, I, I, I can't speak to Starmer in, uh, in the UK. I, I haven't been able to pay as close attention to it. But do I think that Kamala is necessarily going to manage America into decline? No, I don't. I actually think that America is at the beginning of an actual new uh, economic renaissance if it wants it. I think um, uh, this will make you know the sound money theorists really upset, but the United States has basically pulled off an amazing feat, right? Sure, it's a heavily indebted nation, but it's also it's also put itself in a situation of mutually assured destruction with China, at least for now, because China's entire capital stock is like oriented towards like its export markets. It doesn't have the internal uh, consumer consumption right now, especially not with all the the local wealth that went up in flames with the with the real estate bust. There's no way they can like just like juice that demand without creating a hyperinflationary episode that basically collapses the yuan. They know this; they're stuck, so they need export markets and they need them badly. And the United States is like sitting here and it's got consumers and it's also growing its manufacturing base back up and it's moving its manufacturing to Japan and to Vietnam and to South Korea and to the Dominican Republic of all places, um, you know, off it, you know, and so um, uh, the United States is actually, uh, I think, has really pulled the, the wool over everyone else's head here, actually. It's in a very, very strong negotiating position, even as it pertains to its debt structuring, like long-term. It's technological advantage, it's, 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 it's cultural advantages, it's capacity to accept immigrants into the country. China doesn't have that capacity. It's a monoculture. It's, it, 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 the, the, the racism of the Han Chinese against like, um, you know, against like all other like ethnic groups is so pernicious and insane. It has led to expats leaving China over the last five years at an alarming rate. Well, and a cultural genocide of the Uyghurs. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so this idea that like America is entering a period of decline, well, it's like, well, it's decline, I guess, if 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 you want it, if you want, if you want to um, uh, do what Trump and his ilk want to do, which is to withdraw from the world, um, which is the the source of all of that power and leverage I just like talked to you about. Um, then, then yeah, you will, you will, you you could, you will, you will push us more quickly into something that looks like decline, and you will simply allow China and others to gather their strength um, against us and carve up the world. If that's what you want to do. Um, which it seems like uh, a great number of my countrymen want to do. Yes, then 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 vote for Donald Trump. This well, November. okay. So there are a lot of very smart, successful people who want to vote for Trump. Yes, uh, more than fifty percent of the country may vote for Trump. 
yeah. in the next election. Why don't we talk about some of those? Yeah, people? well, I mean, what, what, I'm, I'm no, but rather than talking about people, no, I think we should talk about Elon Musk. We'll I think talk we should, about Elon. I think, we should, I think we should talk about Peter Thiel. No, I think we should talk about David Sachs. These are these are people. These are public figures that have put themselves out there and are absolutely uh, uh, like game for direct criticism and questioning of their motives. Quite honestly, sure, which I don't believe are honest. We should come to that, but, but they're my, not honest motives. But my my point, the, well, the question I have is, even forget these public figures who may have business interests or libertarian principles that they think uh, are more achievable under Trump, but which I think is where you're going to go as part of it. But why do you think Donald Trump may, may win this election? What, you know, where, how do they see the world differently from you? How do they see America differently from you? Um, they, they live in a completely different information environment than I do. Um, they, uh, they consume uh, media from a set of, of demagogic organizations that um, make money making them angry. Um, and Can they, you not make the exact same argument to people who would vote for Kamala? I mean, my dad... My dad, my yeah, dad I mean, doesn't. You, my dad doesn't like Trump. You don't think there's negative? Yeah, there's. Of course, there's negative partisanship on the on the Democratic side, and I'm acting out of negative partisanship against Trump, and I would own that. Like, well, sure. Yeah. I mean, so, at the end of the day, like you're you're making some normative judgment about like what you think is like right and like what you think the the summum bonum of your like existence is, and like you're gonna say, well, like I'm voting against that, and uh, and, and for this. Like, you know, there's a, um, you know, there's a, uh, sometimes like when, when people, when I try to think of myself of like where I am as this like weird, like, like I said before, like something that looks like a conservative liberal and try to like imagine like where, where I exist now, um, in the tapestry of these conversations. Um, and, and I should say like what I mean by conservative, by the way, and like in the intellectual, tr- no, no, no. I mean, I mean the idea that yes, stability is needs to be considered against the forces of change. That when things change too quickly, society can come apart at the seams. That takes time, society needs time to adjust. It needs mechanisms to work out its disagreements internally through the culture, through the media, through political debate, um, through elections. Through all of these like aspects of democratic deliberation that that, that permeate our society, isn't isn't that just but, like a pessimistic view though? Isn't there an no. optimistic view that 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 change could be good? Change is good, but 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 who? What, I mean, what is it? What is but it? Rate you, of change. Rate of change is everything in nature. What is it you fear policy wise that a Trump administration might do that might lead to more instability? He's taking a. He's 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 taken an end run at our at our rule of law at, at, of our system of self government. I mean, like, I, I I get some people are in a media bubble where they think January six was just a little protest that got out of hand, mm-hmm. and that they don't situate that in the full context of several weeks and months of Donald Trump deliberately, deliberately basically winding that mob up into thinking that their country was literally being stolen from them in election conspiracies that everyone around him, including his own daughter, according to reports, Ivanka, were trying to convince him to basically back off from. And everyone around him, eventually, including his own attorney general at the time, one of the most conservative, like, Evil motherfuckers, quite honestly. Like you should look into his his background who, on the uh, uh, Bill Barr okay, yeah. um, and his connection to the Iran Contra affair. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and 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 I would suggest I would suggest this is this man has a very unhealthy addiction to power, and 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 belief in in the goodness of power. Um, even he was pushed to his limit on these election conspiracies and resigned. Hey, listen, I've I um, in 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 in. In the in the lame duck period, and look, and, I, and I've I'm aware of the the, the Georgia phone calls, and uh, it's not just the Georgia no, no, phone bear calls. With, bear with me, bear with me. Like, bear the, with the me. fucking false slates of electors that he and his crew that he was speaking to, like every single day. I mean, read the the Smith indictment that just came out. Yeah, like, just read the whole fucking thing. And I, like, I, read the I, things I, that he was doing that they have that they have testimony on that he was doing. He was coordinating a 
uh, a whole group of people across the country, across multiple states, to create a false set of electors and then try to pressure Mike Pence to acknowledge well, those as the real this, electors yeah. on the Senate floor. That was a conspiracy to steal the Mike, election. Mike, I was about to raise Mike Pence as, as actually he, he is a... He, I think he is an, a bit of a hero in that phase, in that he yes. stood up to Trump and would not. He wouldn't. He wouldn't follow what Trump wanted there. I think. I think people have forgotten about what Mike Pence did there. By the way, again, no horse well, in the you race. You asked me like what stability. No, no, like no, no, I mean, no. it's like, like I mean, like what, yeah, like, no, it's like, a good answer. Like January six. <laughs> it's a good and fair answer. So th this takes me to my next question: Is well, this is what I don't understand. I can objectively see what happened there. I saw what happened on January the sixth. I was watching on TV. It wasn't just January sixth. Yeah, but, but I know. But bear with me. And the build-up. And I'm aware of the phone call. I'm like, I'm aware of all of this. And then what I see, when I see people who are pro-Trump, pro-Republican, pro-MAGA, mm -hmm. they will come up with any excuse for this. Yes. They will, you know, they'll say it's a conspiracy or whatever. They will find a way of washing their hands. Okay, this didn't happen. Yeah. Whereas if the same actions had been done by somebody uh, who was in the Democrat Party... They would have been up in arms. But I see this thing happen both ways. I've probed and prodded um, uh, voters of uh, Kamala on certain things, such as immigration policy, yeah. um, uh, trans uh, yeah. uh, policies. And they will def it literally, it doesn't matter what I bring up, they will defend, defend, defend. And I believe the state of yeah, I mean, it, it, politics at the moment. Partisans is, are like that, right? Yeah, but, but I, but it feels That's what a, so, a partisan is. But it feels partisan to the point of uh, um, that people have dropped their own objectivity. They've they've winning has become more important than the outcome. Yeah, because that's that's the politics of power. Yeah, and <laughs> but that's where we are, and it's like so. I'm that, go right back to the very start of this. Is like, how do we get out of this? How do we escape this? Because I think this is what is the managed decline. I, I know you're optimistic, we're It's not a decline. It's it's not a. We're not in a decline. That's we the are thing. In a we're decline. not. We're in a cultural decline. We are in a cultural relative decline. To we're in an what? economic decline. Relative to what? Okay, so I would say we're in an economic decline because we're gutting the middle class, the distribution of wealth. Yeah. It's it's it, it's it's so it's. I mean, you only have to look at what happened. The middle class COVID. in the United States is not in decline. I'd have to look at the uh, okay. So I obviously this is some, a, this is one of the biggest bullshit narratives that actually both by the, both the far left and the the, the right are telling. The, the, the story is. Do you have far objective data? Nuanced. Because I know in the UK it's happening. I mean, real real wages real wages are up the, over the last two years. We are we have surpassed oh, twenty nineteen now in real wages again, and no one wants to Inflation acknowledge adjusted? this. Yeah, like wage growth has been really really high, particularly in the bottom quintile. In the bottom quintile. Um, wages today, the, the, that's the bottom 25, you take, for those people who don't know how quintiles work, take 100% of people, just uh, divide the population into, into four parts and take the bottom part. Those people have seen their wages grow, I think, since the end of the COVID lockdowns by like 32% or something, which far, even if you look at uh, combined price inflation, I think, and like the CPI is about 21, 22% um, fully baked in. These people are actually um, having the largest amount of net disposable income that they have had in their entire lives right now in the post-COVID era. Now, there are some groups of people um, like the, the upper middle class in particular um, that have seen consolidations in their industries. The software industry has not necessarily been very good to employment. Um, there has been uh certain certain groups got their asses handed to them when the asset bubbles um deflated uh in, in in the covid era and these people feel like they're poorer than they were before but they're actually still quite like rich and and richer than like 98 99% of people and they're the people they're they're the people in these in these conversations that are that are waxing like poetic about the the middle class but I don't know uh, if you go and ask the middle class, the median voter in this country, um, how they're doing economically. You can look this up right now. I, I can't. I mean, I mean, I'm looking up. So it's like it's like 80 percent of people say they're doing financially fine. 
Okay, so real wages in the US have generally been in decline over the last four years when considering inflation. While nominal wages have risen, inflation has eroded purchasing power, leading to a decrease in real wages. The trend began during the COVID-19 pandemic yes. when supply chain disruptions, stimulus measures, We've and labor market positive real wage growth. Yeah, there with it. Nice. From, 2020, from 2021 through 2022, inflation significantly outpaced wage growth, leading to a drop yes. in real wages. Yes. Although inflation has moderated somewhat in 2023, Real wages have only recently begun to recover slightly, but remain below pre-pandemic levels in many sectors. Rising costs in essentials like housing, healthcare, and food have further contributed to the decline in real purchasing power for many workers, particularly in the lower income bracket. Low wage workers saw the most significant real wage growth, particularly those in the 10th percentile, who experienced a 13.2% increase between 2019-2023. Middle and upper middle wage earners, however, saw much smaller gains or even slight declines in real wage growth, depending on the inflation metric used. For example, wage growth measured using uh, CPI, which we know is fucking bullshit, shows less favorable outcomes to the personal consumption expenditure index, especially for workers in higher income brackets. Despite improvements to 2023, real wage growth remains uneven across. So, I mean, look, but you, you might be able just, to draw just out. Look at the, just, look at, just look at people's self-report. Like, when, when you ask, we, this, is, this is what the economists have been talking about with the vibeflation. If you ask voters two questions, and you, you can like, try to like, Google these studies too, look up the, the vibeflation stuff. The, what what um, am I looking at? Vibeflation. Um, or sorry, no, vibe session, not vibeflation, vibe session. Um, inflation's real. Inflation's not vibe a vibe. session. What? What am I looking the for? The vibe session is like the 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 feeling that we're in a recession, even though we're not. Um, basically, um, most Americans, when they're asked, "Are we doing? Am I doing well?" Eighty-one percent of Americans, uh, in the I believe the Gallup survey, said yes. When they said. How much uh, do you believe the rest of the country is doing well? 60, I think like 60 something percent said that they think the rest of the country is doing very economically poorly. There is a complete disconnect between the average American's sense of their own economic well being um, and how they think everyone else is economically doing. There is, uh, this shows up in, I've tweeted about this like several times as these like studies have come out. Um, um, I mean, I can't find the data, but but I don't believe the data I've just l looked up proved your point. Which point? That 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 real. I think real wage growth has been in decline, inflation adjusted. We've I've, it, I'm, it has recovered in in twenty twenty four. We are seeing high levels it's, of real wage growth right now. So and you're seeing this. You're seeing. You're actually seeing this. Actually, even in the polls today, people's you mean it's, view, re you mean it's recovering. People's views of the economy is, are rising. Yes. But it said it's. Below pre-pandemic levels. Yeah, but like, I, so I, I mean, I, if you the, say the, it's the, recovering, I'm I, with you. I'm not trying to discount the very negative experience of inflation that we've had in this country, but like, let's just like look at it. Like, have people's quality of lives diminished? If we look at like indicators, like. What are Americans doing? Are they taking time off? Are they going on vacation? Are they taking flights? What are they doing? Like going to Disneyland, like all these things. Americans are doing this stuff in record numbers. Like we're setting like all time records in the hospitality industry for Americans in this country right now. Like, like not just like the richest of the rich people. Like we're talking about like all, like, you know, all consumer spending groups are engaging in the hospitality industry. Like literally the, the height of like, of like, if, if like, like what what anyone would want to do, like if How? they didn't have to work, if if, if they're in, if they've experienced real world wage decline uh, over the last four years, yeah. How are they affording to do more with less money when things are more expensive? I don't because, understand because they're making a lot because they're 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 finding new ways like to make money and to save money. But like none to, of that makes sense, Mike. It doesn't yeah. make sense because. Th their wages. It does make are, sense. Are it does make sense because it's, hap it's happening. I need objective data to, to prove that because the wages. Data well, it, it says like you said in that in that thing uh, by 2023, like uh, we but had modest real, but yeah. but that has continued to accelerate into 2024. We've seen this quarter after quarter. Real wages have been up, like point one, point one percent, like point two percent, point one percent, like 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 month after month after month after month. It's been creeping back up. Mm. 
I'm not buying it because, okay, I'm not buying it domestically in the UK because I know it's not true. Um, and I'm, I'm, it could very well. I, I mean, but you I'm guys not created, in the you US. Guys created your own like yeah, shit over there by fucked. just this by taking yourselves out of the European common market. But like, but I mean, like, look, the the UK is a completely different beast than the United States. Well, but here in the United States, I mean, people are telling me things different to you. Okay. Well, I know. I mean, I listen to these okay, people, and so, I, I, I disagree with I disagree with their read on the data, and and actually, so I mean, do most economists, but not that they respect them. Uh, according to Gallup and other sources, inflation reduced purchasing power during the period, and even though inflation has cooled in 2023 and 2024, real wage growth remains modest and uneven across different sectors. Workers in lower income brackets have seen the most improvement, while middle and high income earners have struggled to see meaningful gains in real wages. Yeah, like the, the, the wealth gap is like decreasing. Like but literally, that's we, a like, different literally point. like wages are coming up at the bottom and they're struggling at the top. Like, I mean, like, but that's I'm, a different I mean, point because we started with me saying. The middle class is being eviscerated. Yeah, which I'm, is, I'm trying to say I'm trying to say that people like me, right? You're not middle class. <laughs> I'm not middle class. That's what I'm saying. Like, like, like in some like the 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 asset bubble deflation that like I lived through did like, massive damage to my personal net worth when that all came crashing down with like inflation. And I know a lot of people around me that like look at that and they're like, I just want 2019 back. I'm like, well, 2019 was bullshit because you were in a zero interest rate policy environment, and, and like, back. and like, and like, and like risk, and like risk capital. So like, it's just this sense that you have these people at the top that were ex that were basically enjoying false wealth effects right now are complaining about their like stagnant real wage growth when we're sitting here and and by your own acknowledgement the poorest americans are seeing their their real wages increase at the fastest rate right? like it's like no what you're actually seeing is a healthy realignment um in the society as a result of more healthy interest rates and cost of risk capital like in and, and, and that's 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 like leading to and, and we see this. Americans' views of the economy are are, are have been rising steadily this year, um, with a major. I think now slight majorities of Americans now saying that the economy is actually pretty good. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not disagreeing. That's a good thing. But the starting point was again where I came from domestically in the UK. Certainly influenced my my question in that policies are affecting the middle class the most. That's the, the middle class is being eviscerated. I know it is in the UK. It's a fucking nightmare what's happening in the UK. And it's going to get worse under a Labour government. And I actually believe uh, the policies of somebody like Kamala will be worse for the middle class. In what way? At Ledin, we built the best Bitcoin-backed loan platform in the world. Proven, trusted, growing. Ledin's proven track record speaks for itself. Visit ledin.io slash Mr. Obnoxious to get started. Ledin, there is no second best. Ledin is not regulated in the United Kingdom. Any credit products or virtual asset services provided by Ledin are not subject to UK regulatory protections. Please consider the risks associated with virtual assets and consult a financial advisor before making any decisions. My expectation is there will be a continuation of money printing, but that'd be under any administration because of the level of debt. We cannot avoid that. There would be more... What do you think happens? I mean, Donald Trump is talking about ending the independence of the Federal Reserve's I'm, rate setting policy I, and making the president directly responsible for setting interest rates. Like what, like what... By the way, I said... Like what, are, I, like I what are we... To, like what, are, what, what is this comparison that we're, that we're decline, engaging in right here? Well, I said, like I said to you, I believe decline is will happen under either party. Okay, the, the orders of magnitude difference between these two things when you're talking about money printing is just like it's, it's, a, like, it's like not even it's like insane. It's like you're basically like it's like it's it's like like sure, like I mean I I, I don't think it's like an apt comparison, but like I. I'd I'd rather the the chemotherapy than the tumor. Like well, I mean like I mean like I mean like what I mean like what like what like what the. Like the, the chemotherapy is going to do some damage to my body. What was the level of money printing under Biden's administration? I mean, it's the highest ever, right? As a percentage of GDP, and yeah, I mean the the the, the COVID era has been like disaster. I mean, the. You think like, are we are we really going to have this conversation around like the the fiscal responsibility of the, of, of the Republican Party? No, because like, I'm not. I mean, I'm from not, 2016 to 2019, have so, I not been so, clear enough? So, I'm having a conversation about let, the fiscal. No, let, no, 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 no let's finish. talk about. Let's talk. If we're going to talk about fiscal responsibility, yeah. let's put this on the fucking table because no one ever talks about it when we talk about like the Democrats or the left and their like tax and spend policies. Can I just let me just say one thing? I am 
always talking about the fiscal irresponsibility of government because I think they're both up to it, right? I, I mean, I saw this ridiculous t- tweet yesterday about uh, uh, inflation being um, highest under the Biden administration, and uh, and it was retweeted like by Elon uh, Musk. I think he just put true, and his point was like to, to blame and attack the Democrats. But we know that there's a lag with, from money printing and expansion of the money supply to inflation. We know there was a massive stimulus under Trump. A lot of it was caused then. We know that Trump will claim that there was These no inflation. These tax cuts in 2017 I know, but the point brought, is, brought, our, brought, this- brought our deficit up during a period of economic boom to a deficit that actually like reached the levels that we had seen in the 2008 financial crisis in Trump's administration. We had federal deficits that were getting up like 1.8, $1.9 trillion per year, which were levels we had not seen since 2010, 2011. And um, after, after, the, after the, the, the financial crisis and the great recession had hit. And yet like he, his government had brought in, ma- had disposed of massive amounts of, of, of revenue to the government um, following this Grover Norquistian sort of drown the government in the bathtub uh, idea that Republicans have, have been sort of gaming out since the 1990s, sometimes known in, uh, in, inside the beltway as the, as the star of the beast philosophy. You have this pernicious group, um, by the way, like even as I, and I hated these people when I associated myself with the Republican politics because their view of the world was take the government's revenue away. It will run up debt. And when the crisis comes, people will realize that government is not the solution to their problems. This is, this is known as the star of the beast strategy by a pernicious group of Republicans uh, whose like brainchild comes from this guy named Grover Norquist, um, who is uh, basically a tax act advocate who thinks all taxation is theft, like most like libertarians. Um, and that has led to a situation where the Republicans have been incredibly dishonest with the American people. They win elections on promising tax cuts and not actually doing the unpopular thing of cutting entitlements. And that has allowed them to contribute to this fiscal decline. And then as soon as someone like Kamala Harris comes along and says, you know what, we actually are going to like poor, pay for uh, the, poor, the poor kids' cr- cancer treatment, they come along and say, oh, well— um, well, well, you know, like, like how can the government can't like afford any of this stuff? And then when Kamala Harris says, well, I'll, I'll raise, I'll raise corporate taxes back up to 27%, which is still lower than 35% it was before the tax cuts and job act in 2017. And then people say, well, that's destroying capitalism and free markets. It's not an honest conversation that we're actually having about fiscal responsibility here. There's literally one party that is actually prepared to bankrupt the government on principle to prove that the government is not the solution to people's problems so they can actually live out their um, their weird fantasies of like wealthy industrialists running the world. Like that is that is that is like what we're talking about. So even if Kamala Harris is coming along with, yes, like I think I think she needs to be a little bit more. If if it was if it was my, in my world, she'd be a little bit more fucking honest about this. She would say, you know what, we're on a fiscal trajectory that is unsustainable. Um, we are going to at some point enter a debt spiral. Every economist thinks this who is worth their salt that at some point this is going to happen, and we don't know when it's going to happen, um, but it could happen, and. We also know, that will happen. And we also know that Americans want certain things from their government. So we're going to have to have an honest conversation about the taxes that we're willing to pay, the levels of taxes that we're willing to pay, and who pays them. And we need to have a healthy conversation about the politics of distribution. Can we some need- numbers? Sure. Okay. So under George W. Bush, the debt increase was $4.9 trillion. Percentage increase in debt was 100%. Uh, debt as a percentage of GDP... By the end of his term, increased from 54% we'll do that. Okay. to 77%. Then Barack Obama, $8.6 trillion, But obviously, we know that was 2008. He inherited yeah. three to four years of the worst recession this country had seen since the Great Depression. So that the you expect <laughs> governments to not necessarily be... Uh, not, really? You, I thought there was a boom because they re-stimulated the economy. I mean, the economy took a long time to get back to low unemployment. We uh, had we had a housing. But low unemployment that, is a recession. Recession is negative uh, GDP growth. 
yeah, I mean, but like, but it, it was, we fell a lot and the climb out was growth, hmm. but it took a long time. I mean, you can just look at it, look at the GDP uh, graphs. Anyway, like, let's finish the these numbers. So that was a debt increase of 8.6 trillion. Yeah. Uh, percentage increase in debt was 74%. Um, uh, debt as a percent of GDP uh, increased from 77 to 104%. Uh, Donald Trump, uh, $7.8 trillion. Uh, percentage increase in debt, 36%. Debt as a percent of GDP uh, increased from 104 to 129%. Uh, Joe Biden uh, projected by the end of the term will be $7.9 trillion, so about the same as Trump. Uh, projected increase in debt from 24 to 25%. Uh, and uh, projected debt to GDP of, of over 130 percent. So essentially speaking, Donald Trump and Joe Biden, give or take mm -hmm. a few billion, have, uh, have been about the same. Um, yeah, but so just, just the trajectory right now is different. Well, is it? Yes, like right now on our current trajectory, um, we <laughs> we will in the next five years face a mass like we like the. The the graph is accelerating up and to the right um, in terms of our uh, in terms of the the from a fiscal sustainability perspective, the servicing costs on that debt right now have now exceeded a trillion dollars per year in um, in interest payments, and that is actually rising really really rapidly as some of that five year and seven year paper is being rolled over onto new treasury debt at higher interest rates than they were back you know, mm -hmm. at, in, in the height. So there's this massive fiscal cliff that's like ahead of us right now um, as we roll over that low interest rate debt um, onto this higher interest debt that's going to cause massive ballooning expenditures on the debt servicing costs. And yes, somebody, and, and so when I look at that and I look at what Donald Trump is saying about like rate policy and I see what he's saying about like tariffs and all this other crazy shit. Yes. Kamala Harris, like Kamala Harris's policies of like actually trying to go and raise revenues with somewhat higher taxes on certain aspects of the society uh, of our society, um, as well as her, um, various other proposals do a lot less damage on that trajectory. But still, she will not avert crisis. She will still meet crisis, but she will meet it somewhat more down the road. Trump will accelerate it if he says what... I've got some interesting numbers for you. So one thing that last set of numbers didn't uh, account for is mm -hmm. that uh, both George W. Bush and uh, Barack Obama were both eight-year terms. Yes. They just accumulated for both. But under George W. Bush, it was point. Oh, that's, that's a good point. Yeah, 0.35 trillion. So it's twice the rate of growth, so, actually, yeah. under Trump, as it was under Obama. And Biden. So 0.35 trillion in, in 2001, his first year, George Bush. And the biggest year was his final year, 1 trillion. But most year, that years... That makes more sense. Because yeah. if you go and look at what happened to the deficit after the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act was passed in 2017, 2018, um, it, it, it ballooned. Uh, it it exp the, the the size of government revenues collapsed. Um, uh, it, it it did not do what Paul Ryan and others had promised. Was they said it would actually increase tax receipts from more economic activity. The only evidence that we have uh, that the tax cuts had is it it did seem to spur a little bit more capital investment. Companies um, did seem to increase investment in in, in productivity. Um, and uh, um, taking building, you know, but marginal, like five to six percent increase ultimately in, ca in 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 capital expenditures by companies that that was probably affected by those tax cuts. But for the most part, but for the most part, it 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 just led to wealth effects among among the people who who owned that capital. Okay, look, some more numbers and, so, and, and led to massive deficits for the government. So in two thousand seven, it was uh, half a trillion with George Bush, and then it was a trillion in two thousand eight. And two thousand eight is when the financial crisis hit. Yes. So I expect that was an in increase. The fall of that year, yeah. Yeah. Lehman Brothers collapsed. And Barack Obama's first uh, year was one point six trillion. So that is within two years. Uh, a, a tripling, an over tripling of the the, the debt increase. Now, uh, uh, Obama in 2010 was 1.65, but then it started to drop. So it went 1.2, 1.28, 1.1, 1.02, 1.05, uh, and then 1.42 in his final year. I always wonder if there's a, like a, a bit of extra spend in the final year, and that that's because they want to win an election. But anyway, Donald Trump's first year, not much beyond um, uh, 
Obama's first year. It, it went from 1.42 to 1.5. Then it was 2.5 in 2018, 3.5 in 2019. Obviously, that was COVID. 20- no, 2019 was not COVID. COVID didn't hit until early 2020. That was that was the result of Trump's tax cuts, um, basically exploding the deficit. Um, because the Republicans cut taxes, but they did not cut spending. Hold on. Let me, I'll come back to that then. Let me check that. Uh, and then final year of $3 trillion. And Then Joe Biden, again, increased first year, 3.4, dropped to 2.6, 2.1, then back to 2.4. Um, and so what it seems to me is like, firstly... Um, 2017, 2018, and 2019 were the, up until recently, were the periods where everyone agrees we had massive economic growth, and that was a period where government revenues were declining rapidly. And why was that happening? Because Republicans were cutting, they were cutting taxes without cutting spending. Yeah, so... The which, U- which, 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 by the way, is dishonest as fuck. I'm sorry. So here here you go. So 2020, the US government passed several large stimulus packages in response to COVID-19, the Coronavirus Aid, Relief and Economic Security Act, 2.2 trillion. Uh, Debt increased around 3.5 trillion in 2020 due to large relief measures. And under Joe Biden, upon taking off in 2021, Biden passed the American Rescue Plan, fed it 1.9 trillion, furthering uh, direct payments and debt increase. So look, but look, look, I think, yeah, let's just... Let's zoom out. America has Well you made a, my point for me about the about how Trump ballooned the deficit at a time when the, the, the country was like in a massive economic boom. Yeah. No, no, I'm not dis- I'm not disagreeing, but what I'm saying is generally, like if you if you zoom out, America has a debt problem. America's government has a debt problem. Like administration after it, yes, it's, it's not like a, a any, problem, it's not like any party that you can go. Oh, they've been they've been great. With we're the not debt. near the precipice yet, though. No, but then, it's not like we're any, on a trajectory that's very scary. But like, yeah, one trillion we, of debt interest. Get another six seven years out of this before before real crisis hits. And and then when the real crisis hits, whoever's in power is going to take the blame. They're going to try and blame previous parties, but it's the problem of government historically because yeah. there's a debt problem no one wants to deal with. This is the thing I'm trying to say. It's like it's all fucked. That's why I don't vote. We've got, I mean, we've got a similar. It's not as extreme in the UK. We've got, we've got, we've but, got a moderate two point four trillion of debt. Peter, I think the difference between you and me is like I don't think pol- politics isn't something you do at the ballot box. Politics is something we're doing right now. Politics is something I'm going to do when I step outside this door. Um, it's uh, we make our choices. That the, uh, that we have a simple, we have a simple duty. I have a simple duty as an American citizen. Um, uh, in this country, as it pertains to my obligation to uh, participate in self-government, is picking the person, given the choices in front of me, that um, along a few axes of considerations, one of which is like, how likely is this person to actually be able to take power um, for good or for bad? In the cases of Donald Trump, he's very likely to take power, and I think he's a very, very bad person. So I um, I start from a position of a little negative partisanship, uh, to be to be honest with you, and then I take a look at someone like Kamala Harris, and then I evaluate her, um, and in some ways, um, have a, there's a lot of things that um, I could desire out of her, but I, I also don't think that she's this like disaster, like that um, some people are making it out to uh, out, out to be. Um, I think her, there her, must her, be better candidates. Her views, her her views, her views are pretty pedestrian centrist views that aren't really like that far out of the ballpark of the kinds of politics of distribution that we were talking about even in the second term of the George W. Bush administration with like the advent of like things like Medicare Part D and stuff. People forget that like under the George W. Bush administration, Republicans were expanding welfare programs. Like Medicare Part D was like one of George W. Bush's like seminal achievements the Republicans put through, which was to pay for prescription drugs for <laughs> for people on Medicare. Like that was not a democratic thing. Um, there was like there was a time in this country where, and that, that was like literally George W. Bush. Um, and uh, and then you have like the Obama administration and people thought he was going to like go far left and like actually like a lot of like people on the far left now view him as like a corporate Democrat that like took the side of the big banks and stuff like that. I mean, the reality is, is that like Kamala Harris is probably just like more of that. Like she's just mm. like, she's a career politician. Uh, I don't think she's terribly ideological. I think she's going to be pretty responsive to political gravity. She's 
I think she's trying to adopt positions that will get her elected. And then people say, Clearly. well, what, oh, no, no, but like, but no, but like, hold, hold on a second though. People are so, but are they, are they like truly held positions? I'm like, oh, I don't, I don't fucking know. I mean, like, look, we, most politicians that I studied very, very closely, um, successful ones, um, career politicians are largely just um, like professional politicians are literally just people who are just like trying to uh, find some way to connect themselves with the political party around themselves and the people outside. And they're trying to mediate um, a political relationship. Um, and and there are professional politicians that are like, I like Biden is kind of like this too. Like he he's, people have always said, he's just always, his view has always been whatever the middle of the democratic party is. That honestly, people get mad at that and they say it's inauthentic and it's like not down to earth and it's like not what they like truly think. And That's I'm like all political maneuvering. And I'm like, and I'm like, I don't really give a shit. Honestly, like if Kamala Harris is looking at the polls and she's saying to herself, I'm gonna believe like whatever like the middle of America believes, like whatever I said, like in the fucking primary debates of like 20. 2019 and 2020 at the height of like the the black lives matter fewer and all uh, you know you know that 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 was like consuming this country like i'm like like whatever like i don't need her to basically like basically convince me that she's like adopted some like centrist ideology i'm like relatively sure that she's not ideological and that she'll actually be somewhat steered by the forces around her namely what will get her no what will get her elected what what people actually want like like what like what what people in the middle like like want to see in the kinds of policies that they want, which is yes, stricter border like regulation. You've seen her just completely embrace this. She just completely accepts that the only way that the center at this point is going to regalvanize around like her is that Democrats are going to have to crack down on immigration and the border policy. And so she's done that. And people say, but she doesn't really believe that. She's going to get in and she's going to like yeah, but that's what adopt some is. far left policy. It's like that's not that's not what's going to happen. But that's that's crazy. what politics is. It's listening to people and putting policies that that people want. And why are people so mad? They're saying it's inauthentic that she's doing this, that she's changing her views all, all to the center. Are, there's, no, there's no authenticity. Like authenticity who, who the fuck politics. cares? Like, like, what more could you ask for? But, a politician that's giving us what we want? Can I tell you the only thing that would make me vote again? If some, like, we have a similar debt problem in the UK. It's 2.2 or 2.4 trillion. So we're magnitudes lower than the US. We have a, a, a deficit, a government deficit of running at about, I don't know, 100 billion a year. Um, which doesn't sound too. I just scary. want to say you really kept me out of trouble earlier. I was really gonna. I know, go but, into those people and well, you can Silicon Valley you can still got, We've still got time. We've still got, <laughs> we've still got half an hour. Um, but but I see the trajectory of debt, and I see the trajectory of these. You know, and Lynn Alden tells us over and over again. Yeah. The the inflation and interest uh, uh, journey we're going on is a roller coaster. Yep. Uh, they will have to print more money. That will yep. lead to more inflation. That will lead to higher interest rates. And yep. it's going to get more volatile because nobody wants to deal with the debt problem. Yep. The only way I come back and vote if somebody says, we're going to deal with the debt problem. very important that you don't lose this, okay? This is your inheritance through Bitcoin. Ah, oh, Let Bitcoin rip. Don't rip up your Bitcoin. Set up inheritance with Casa. But why no, is that the only reason? Like, why is that the only thing that matters I've, to you? Like, don't you realize, like, you have a, you have a fucking, um, uh, uh, imperialist, uh, revanchist, like, imperialist power um, at the at the eastern frontiers of of the of the European <laughs> Union, and like and you have China, which is like with its like Confucianist institutes at 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 your great universities uh, in, in the UK, like literally like trying to like eat your like democratic way of life uh, alive from the inside out, and you're sitting here telling me like I'm not going to like politically participate until politically until someone until someone gets the books in order like it's yes. like yes yeah absolutely that's, that's, i'm telling you that's i, I just think that but I, you haven't I, heard my reason okay okay we are in a managed decline 
because no one will deal with the debt problem. That's and I, not the reason we're in a managed decline. We are in a managed decline. In the UK, then, I'm going to tell you, we are in a managed decline. I'm seeing it. I'll give you one great example. One of my, business, one of my businesses now, I'm thinking of closing down. Okay? Yeah. And the reason I'm thinking of closing it down is because the number, and, and actually other businesses I was thinking of opening, I may not bother now. Because the ability to create a business and generate a profit and a return to myself that makes it worthwhile is diminishing. diminishing. Bear with me. And it's diminishing due to public to, to government policy. You start with, you have a business rate at the start. That is a tax you pay before you start the business. Then you start the business and you employ people. But you have such strict employment laws, they become so expensive to employ people, you can't mark up your products enough to cover it. Okay, And then by the time you get to the end of the year, just say you make a profit, just say you do, you have to then pay corporation tax. And then if I get a profit, I pay dividend tax. If I choose to save that money... And then they're talking about increasing capital gains tax from 20 to 39%. I look at it and go, the risk reward does not exist. Now, if the risk reward doesn't exist yeah. for me, it, it, it doesn't exist there's for a hur- There's a hurdle right there yeah. that you have to get over as, as a e- business owner. Yeah. And I, if it doesn't exist for me, it doesn't exist for a lot of people, right? And why does that exist? Well, why do we have such high tax? And why are they taxing everything when they're finding new taxes yeah. increasing everything? Because they cannot get spending under control. And this is only going to get worse. The Laffer, the Laffer curve is going to be tested. If they increase capital gains tax of 39%, as they're rumored to be doing, we've just seen they've done it on Bitcoin in Italy. You are going to see, I mean, we've got we've got we've we've got mass exodus of millionaires from the UK at the mm. moment. Now, uh people on the left will say, oh, they're fucking tax dodgers. No, they're pe- they're not tax dodgers, they're people who've either they've worked hard maybe been a bit lucky, their parents worked hard, and they don't want to have their savings eviscerated because government can't get spending under control. Yeah, what, what, bear with who, me, bear with me. I'm, I'm, on, I'm on, my, on my rant now. And the point being is, where does, this, where does this all end? We are not going to get growth from redistribution. Growth isn't coming from there. And so if we're not going to get growth, and debt is going to increase, and they're going to keep attacking uh, 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 people through taxes, and the tax burdens percent of GDP is going to keep growing, they're going to have to keep borrowing more, and it means we are heading to our own cliff that we're going to fall off. And when we go off that cliff, I don't know what happens. Happens, but I think it's pretty fucking bad. And so for me, it is the primary issue of t- of today is to solve spending, solve debt, and not have the kind of scary inflation that we've seen destroy countries. So well, that's it. Well, here's I mean? the thing. I mean, if you want to like get, I mean, if you want to get the, de- the 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 fiscal sustainability of the UK under control, then you're going to have to get economic growth back. Clearly, like the political economies of this is not going to simply let you cut spending um, without like complete social disarray. You'll just like, I mean, th- th- this I don't is, buy that. By the way, I believe there's a hundred billion you can cut from government spending. May- maybe, maybe, but like I, 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 you know, here's the thing: is that at the end of the day, um, and look, I, I look, I, uh, I, uh, I've listened very carefully to to uh you know the 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 musings of rory stewart um in in your country um you listen to the rest of politics i i do and i i follow i i I like rory yeah rory's uh i I, I don't like the warmonger he does it with alistair campbell he was um the warmonger yeah he was uh tony blair's um what do you call him i mean is it Spin Doctor? Was he a Spin for Doctor? For the Iraq War. Yeah. yeah. Um, and and I've, I've listened to them debate it. He took us into the Iraq War and he's never taken full ownership from it. I even saw, an, they, they were talking about it recently. He was like, I'm still fed up that people, like, that's the first question they bring up when they interview me. He took us into a fucking war where we killed hundreds of thousands of Iraqis and destabilized a region. Keep answering the question, motherfucker. Sorry. Yeah. Personal rant. That's Fuck fair. You. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I have my own... My own views um, on 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 the, on the Iraq War as well, um, but look, I think, and that's that's actually like a pretty uh, worthy discussion of itself, and <laughs> yeah. how that uh, I think I think I think we'd be living in a different reality had that war not happened. Um, but I, I don't think you get Trump, by the way, if you don't have the Iraq War. No, we probably don't leave e- the EU. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, but on my point. Yeah, so you I, understand what I'm saying? I, I do, I do, um, but I mean, Brexit, Brexit was a was a massive self inflicted wound on uh, on a country that had made uh, itself made a like from a just a basic trade perspective. Uh, UK had created a bunch of comparative advantage with its. Uh, 
uh, with other with other uh, parts of the European Union in terms of like ser- the service sector and the financial sector, like the like London. And London we had the rebate. Yeah, the, you had the, the rebate. Um, and uh, the Brexiteers uh, convinced themselves that they were going to become like Hong Kong or Singapore or fucking the Dubai of fucking Europe. And I never really understood, even at the time, because um, I had some, you know, I, 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 have, I have a friend there. He lives in uh, Chiswick in, in London, and he was a— It's a beautiful world. You know, it, there's a, there's a he, giant building there he, called McCormack House. Yeah, he has a—, he has a, he has a um, uh, he was a Brexiter, and I used to argue with him uh, um, on behalf of Remain. Or I would get in these like really tense uh, co- uh, text message conversations with him about it. Um, but yeah, I mean, like the the UK was able to export its its like professional class um, in a in a really effective way within the European markets. And it wasn't clear to me, like when you actually looked at like trade flows, what does the UK import? What does it export? You know, it's obviously it has these raw material sectors that aren't terribly efficient. Um, it just seemed to me, if you isolate this country now from the common market with all this comparative advantage that you've built up, you are going to destroy like uh, a massive amount of economic activity in this country. Um, and that's going to un- unwind. That's going to have serious deleterious effects um, uh, throughout, throughout the economy of this continent. And then, and, then, and then something happened that the Brexiteers weren't counting on, right? Which was the, the, a lot of them like these sort of, you know, neo Thatcherian sort of neo Ragonian uh, thinking to themselves, we're going to have another like uh, 1980s where we're going to like deregulate, deregulate. We're going to embrace the 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 animal spirits of the free market are going to like come basically blowing through uh, the the. Uh, the the cities and, and, and the towns and the hamlets of 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 the United Kingdom, and then a funny funny thing got in the way is that um, as always happens, you have a Labour government now. Is that like you, things things don't variables don't tend to stay constant for very long, and so a lot of that free wind that the UK had at its back from that comparative advantage built up, you know, with the, with the city of London. Um, which was a fulcrum of the UK economy and its its competitiveness um, there um, was just taken away, um, and now people still want their health care. They're still mad at the NHS. The NHS they still do all this other stuff, and they don't stop fighting for that stuff. And now you're and now you're doing it from a far less efficient economy mm-hmm. with, uh, um, and now you're having to pay higher borrowing costs, like even relative to the United States, because at least the US has. The, the trade flows in and out of it to to command a little bit more of a premium um, than say the UK does where you with or without Brexit, I still think we would be in a similar ish position because look at the rest of the EU. I think the EU and the UK would be doing better if that didn't happen. Sure. But in we fact, would still all have fact, masses think, of debt, and I mean the the problems of the EU go way way beyond. I, I think there's I, I might be Pollyannish about this, but like another there's another alternative history there because you're seeing this right, like you're seeing, um, you know, Emmanuel Macron uh, in particular, and and some of these other like figures in in Europe that are now starting to talk really really seriously about like really having a tough conversation about the the relationship of of the government and the private sector and you have like Macron sounding increasingly like Thatcher in the 80s right now um i think you had i think if the uk was still in the european union like given the way that things have gone like particularly covid i think the uk would have been a really positive influence on helping push some of those reforms quite honestly and honestly probably having survived a very close brexit referendum where they had stayed in i think the eu would have been uh in a far more uh reformist mood after that having felt like they had just like had a brush with death and i think the uk would have had a lot more leverage I think it would have uh, led to maybe a lot more reforms in Brussels, um, and uh, and I think that 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 possibility was 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 denied us by the by the surprise result. Shh. Yeah. By the way, it was. <laughs> uh, I tell you the story of when it happened. So I actually voted Remain in the end. I was so on the <laughs> fence. Uh, I was at Glastonbury, and when I went to bed, I was with my kids. So I went to sleep, and uh, it looked like Remain had won. 
you know, the polling was coming back, the early votes were coming back, Remain had won. As I went to bed and I woke up in the morning, and typically at Glastonbury, that's like the English uh, v- version of kind of Burning Man ish. Uh, I took my kids, go to get breakfast, and this woman's like wandering around, wailing, like crying. I was like, fucking hell, what's going on with her? So I go to her, go, are you okay? And she's like, I can't believe, I can't believe it. We're leaving the EU. I was like, huh? I was like, I thought Remain won. She was like, no. The Brexiteers won. She was crying her eyes out. I was like, huh? Didn't see that coming. So yeah, it happened. But I still did look, Mike. Yeah, we, 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 uh, mi- we, 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 we misread something. I the think... cosmopolitan elite like me misread something in that moment. The Including <laughs> including in the Trump moment in 2016. We, mis- we misread something. Well, look, but populism is always a reaction to people feeling unheard. Mm-hmm. And so there are criticisms of populism. It's, it's, but I believe, I believe all politics is a form of popul- populism. <laughs> I, I just do. Um, it's, it, but anyway, I don't agree. But I don't, I don't think I don't think well, I, 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 I don't think I don't think what Curtis Yarvin in Silicon Valley is pushing is a form of populism. But like, but yeah. But look, it's there is a there is a significant part of the UK population that felt unheard. Okay, they just felt unheard, and they felt life was getting harder and worse and more difficult for them and and it uh, was and it was yeah. ways. no of course it was but they were they were showing a theater of why it was happening and you know they voted but i still fundamentally believe the numbers might be slightly different we would because governments overspend we would still be in a position where we would be running a deficit and have a debt problem i 100% believe that would happen because it's here in the us it's happening in Japan. It's happening through all Western liberal democracies. It's happening through Europe. I don't mm. think us not having Brexit. So it, it takes me back to my same position: is that I am only interested in anyone. But what is it you think is happening there? Because you think that you, if, if I tell me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like you're you're saying that the real culprit is this uh, regulatory raj that you have in in. Um, uh, in the UK and the high taxes, and I and like, look, no, I that's get, a problem. I get, it, I get at the margin. The I get at the margins that that can have negative like economic growth effects. But I mean, th- th- we, this this. You asked me a question. Let me tell you what the answer is. Okay. The problem is, is you have a household budget and a mortgage and a house and car loans and blah blah blah. Everybody has these things, and you get paid and you manage that budget through the month. And sometimes you take on debt to be able to pay off. Uh, uh, to be able to um, to buy things you want. Yeah. You know, houses, cars, whatever. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but if you don't pay that debt, you lose your house. If you stop paying and your credit rating goes, you can't borrow anymore. Um, and you have to run a budget. But when you're government, you have this thing like up in your in your office where you, there's a button you can print more money if you need it. You just mm-hmm. keep printing it, keep printing it. And you socialize the losses across everybody else. Mm-hmm. And you just keep going and you, pa- you kick the can down the road mm-hmm. and you pass it onto a... F- Unfortunately, it's, it's, it's game of hot potato. One administration is going to come in uh, and they're going to have to deal with the collapse. Mathematically. Yeah, it's a political economy problem. Yes, yes. It's a political economy problem. And that's the best. As, 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 as and, m- 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 many of our, our, big, our big problems are. Like, this is why we, you know, there's libertarians, like, uh, you know, libertarians are at their best when they're pushing things like public choice theory and things like that, that, like, um, in, in, in their. In their in their critiques of this stuff, that I, I you know I, I think that, um, that that that's when they're at their best, and and I think that, that that's when we need to like really think like deeply about um, these kinds of like perverse incentives, but um, but like the thing is is that like keeping the music going another day is another day for us to have more opportunities, more technological progress, more political progress, more cultural progress, more opportunity for us to people like me hopefully to. Regalvanize and reorganize around um, small L liberal ideas, which, as I said um, much earlier in this conversation, I think are incredibly important for um, there being something that that seems like a positive future. And I think there's a lot of people that um, are very much diametrically opposed to that. I think they want to rule the world. I, sure. I think they want to literally rule the world. So back to my point about what would bring me back to vote. Do you understand the position I've taken? That I do. That is the I, primary I, 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 I concern. Under, I understand it. I'm 
deeply frustrated by it because mm-hmm. I think it's very obvious to me that like if if you can, even if you believed what that you like, if in the case of say you were an American citizen, which I recognize that you're not, so I'm putting you in this like unfair hypothetical situation. Yeah, yeah sure. But I mean, if you're sitting here telling me like. I'm just like not going to vote because neither of these candidates um, uh, suggest to me, based on the things that they've said, like uh, a sufficient understanding of the the necessity of the, the 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 fiscal dilemma that we're in. You know, my my view is like this: it's like, well, y- you shouldn't be trying to convince them through your vote. You should be trying to convince Americans that they should care about this. That when they pick their candidates and um, you know, like, uh, and and parties like figure out like who, like who they're going to put up for election, like one way or the other, then you hope that that's sort of like downstream of like a really important cultural conversation of like what's what. That's what happened in the neoliberal era with like the rise of like Ra- uh, Thatcher and Reagan. You had folks like Milton Friedman, who was a powerful communicator of his ideas. Um, and was hugely influential on what would become sort of what we think of as like this like modern um, conservative thought, like neoliberal thought, the the rise of like the Washington consensus in terms of things like trade policy, ultimately culminating in in bringing China into the WTO in 1997, which in retrospect was maybe a serious political mistake. Um, but like the 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 the. Uh, like there was there was a moment in time where those ideas were able to capture um the 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 minds of, of very powerful um politicians like like Thatcher like Reagan um and and honestly even even Tony Blair I mean his third way socialism in a sense was just repackaged neoliberalism for the labor party um he was very centrist yeah no that's what I mean it was a repackaged yeah. neoliberal like he was uh uh, he called it third way. They called it third way socialism, but it was new kind labor. Of, yeah, it was new labor. But the mm. but what the intellectuals called it was third way socialism, which was just basically a funny way of saying, yeah, it's capitalism, but like we're also going to like do some taxes and welfare programs, um, which was basically like okay, but well, that's just like democratic liberalism too. It just this is stupid. Uh, it, it's the same ideology with a different word. But anyway, but but um, but I I I think that that. That that was like a really powerful moment where like people like really believed in those ideas, and now because we're having like I said earlier, we're having conversations about the politics of power. There isn't really much space to have these conversations, which is what this is about the politics of distribution, the the politics of like how much money should we spend, how much debt should we take on as a society, how much taxes should we be willing to to to, to raise to pay for the things that we think are important. Those are the conversations. Those are the politics of distribution. And okay. we absolutely have to have those conversations again. Back to the politics of power. Final question, because we're running out of time. Why do you believe the Silicon Valley elite, the neighbors from here, uh, seem to all be back in Trump? Because they think he's bought and paid for. Um, I think Elon Musk uh, uh, and David Sachs in, in, uh, uh, in particular recognize that Donald Trump is out of his mind. I think they recognize he's crazy. You could just like sit there and like watch that like the, the rally of like Musk and, and Trump and the, the, the awkward conversation of them sitting in the tent with each other and stuff like that. I mean, there's no way that Musk doesn't realize, I mean, Musk's crazy himself, but there's no way he doesn't recognize that Trump's completely out of his fucking mind. I think what Musk, because he's kind of close to this like cabal of like Silicon Valley elite, that's like really close to people like Yarvin and, 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 uh, and to, you know, these, Guys like Blake Masters and and ultimately like JD Vance, the, the senator, junior senator from Ohio, who's now on the the ticket with with Donald Trump. I think I think they they honestly think about there's a real chance that um, Donald Trump will either maybe die in office or maybe something maybe there'll be some major scandal, pretty likely, and then and then um, uh, uh, someone like JD Vance could could try to invoke the Twenty Fifth Amendment with a majority of the cabinet. Um, and then that would remove. There'll be a coup. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think I think these I think they think they've I think they've bought and paid for Vance. I think Vance is a, a true believer of Curtis Yarvin's ideology, and I think he's playing this MAGA game. I think he thinks these people are all a bunch of idiots. But he was very critical of Trump previously. Yeah, I think he thinks they're all a bunch of idiots. I think he thinks Trump is an idiot, um, and I think these people uh, I think these people are playing a, a shell game. It's why like. I mean, Musk is clearly just making shit up. 
Like, I mean, he's like, he's clearly like now fucking with the algorithm. I mean, there's many, many, there's a lot of good, like I, his there's a lot got, got shit. There's a lot <laughs> of good evidence though that um we've seen uh that that I've started to see some like viewer impression graphs on some really really well followed like anti-Trump accounts that have just like fallen off of a cliff um in the past few months um which I think is I I is I Is this think, election interference? No, I mean it's a private company. It can do whatever the fuck it wants. Uh, but I and but you know I think it's I think it needs to be called out, and people need to know like what it is. Um, I think that Musk. Uh, I think Musk. Musk wants. Musk realizes he can't be president because uh, um, he's not a natural born citizen. But I think he thinks that he's bought and paid for this Trump administration. I think he's gonna. He thinks he's gonna get to run this government um, essentially um, through the back door. And I think uh, he thinks Vance is gonna like help him help him do that. He should probably be careful because I think Vance is a very very dark figure in, in American politics. Why? Um, I, I believe. Uh, I mean, just I would recommend to go and read his uh, or his uh, interview with Vanity Fair from two years ago, where he, um, where at the very end of it, um, and there's audio. The audio recording of the interview was released, um, so you can hear that he wasn't quoted out of context. Um, he he said that I think Trump is going to win. Um, I think Trump is going to uh, run again in in 2024, and when he does, um, he should come into power, and then he should uh, once he's sworn in. I think he said something to the effect of that Trump should then fire every mid level bureaucrat in the whole federal government that is like that stands in his way. Um, of enacting his agenda. And if the Supreme Court um, tries to stop him, then he should uh, invoke, I believe, uh, the former president, Andrew Jackson, by saying uh, the chief justice has made his decision and now let's see him enforce it. He literally openly called for a constitutional coup. I've repeatedly tweeted this out many times over the past few few months um, to try and get people to 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 see this. Um, uh, it it is it is it is it is definitely um, worth a read. I'm trying to find it. Is this the one where he said it's deranged to avoid having children? No, it's three days ago. No, it's from two years ago. I can find it on YouTube. I have it right here. It's called Inside the New Right, where Peter Thiel is placing his biggest bets. Can you send that to me on? I will. But here's the thing. Yeah. Here's give me a big end. I'm, I'm just going to read you. I'm going to read for you from the article. This is this is this is this is Vance talking. And by the way, the, the audio version of this interview has been been released by the by the journalist, so you can you can hear it out of his own mouth. Um, if you think he's being misquoted or quoted out of context. I think Trump is going to run again in 2024, he said. I think that's what Trump should do. If I was giving him one piece of advice, fire every single mid-level bureaucrat, every civil servant in the administrative state, in, in the administrative state, we should talk about why that's illegal under the Pendleton Act, um, but that's me talking, um, and replace them with his people. And when the courts stop you, he went on, Stand before the country and say, he quoted Andrew Jackson, giving a challenge to the entire constitutional order. The chief justice has made his ruling. Now let him enforce force it. This is the journalist speaking, uh, and I agree with his sentiment. This is a description essentially of a coup. And Vance uh, responding to this says, we are in a late Republican period, Vance said, later evoking the common new right view of America as Rome awaiting its Caesar. If we're going to push back against it, we're going to have to get really wild and pretty far out there and go in directions that a lot of conservatives right now are uncomfortable with. So I mean Civil War man. So when people say that he is just this like thinks he's a small government pro-business conservative that's on the view uh, on, on he he I believe Vance is literally using Musk. He's using Trump. And he is deeply enmeshed, and you should, and your viewers should look into the the ideology of Curtis Yarvin. Um, uh, I'm 
probably need to write uh, a sub stack on this in, in, some amount, time. in some amount of detail. Um, but yeah, I, I, I have serious questions there about like what the motivations of some of these, these Silicon Valley elites that are giving, that are talking to, from what I hear from conversations of people I know close to some of these, these people um, are talking with him like almost every day. We're giving him advice on the debate. We're giving him advice on how to, like, I know that we're, we're talking with, with Don Jr., who uh, ultimately convinced Trump to bring Vance into the campaign. And, and uh, Vance had developed a very close relationship with John, Don Jr., which I think was helped along by a lot of these, like, Thiel, acolyte, Thiel acolytes. And like, if you start to, like, piece it all together, um, yeah, I, I, think there's, I think there is a group of, of sinister, rich, powerful people who have a serious weed up their ass um, about the fact that they're now hated by everyone for blowing up the entire world by like, you know, polluting our brains and making our kids depressed and, 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 uh, and suicidal. And they, the whole, the regulatory state is coming after them. Lena Khan wants to break up their countries and they're like, fuck this, fuck you. Like I, I'm like a self-made fucking man. I'm done with this shit. If this is what the democracy is going to vote for, then I want some of the shit that Curtis Yarvin is selling. And I think that that's what JD Vance like represents. And I think a lot of people are too fucking stupid to see it. And if you just like literally like read his own words and read some and just listen to some of these interviews that he has had, even since becoming the senator of Ohio, like that those that quote from him in 2020 late 2022 not that long ago is he is with a straight face talking about overthrowing the US constitution like what like what the like how is how are we having a serious conversation on whether or not Kamala Harris is worse or not because because she's not going to get our fiscal fucking house in order and you literally have a guy over here who is literally talking about telling the supreme court to go fuck itself and do whatever and 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 rule however he wants to rule like i don't know what is go it's going to take to get people to wake up from the fact that this is like deeply fucking serious i'm not making this up this isn't a conspiracy theory this is his own fucking words in a reputable uh and and in a in a reputable um, journal and uh, and the the journalist has released the footage and he said things in other forums that like 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 that back it up. He's defended these views. Like people have like released footage of him like uh, having like these like conversations with crazy right wing nut jobs of like buying into this whole monarchist like type thinking of Curtis. He said he says good things about Curtis Yarvin in that very article. By the way, in that full interview, like I don't know Curtis Yarvin is for the overthrow of the U.S. Constitution. Vance quotes Yarvin as his like favorite philosopher and thinker. He has said things that sound deeply seditious, that are deeply seditious like that. And he is currently on the vice presidential ticket of a man who is clearly losing his fucking mind, is clearly like um, likely to get thrown out of office through, article, through uh, the 25th Amendment or impeachment, or he's going to die in office from old age because his age is quite advanced. He's 80, what, 80 years old now. Is he? Okay. Yeah. Um, like... <sighs> This I, is, I hear, I hear this, is, this is, this is, this is, like, this is, like I said in my piece, uh, and maybe that's a good place to end. This is fucking serious. Well, listen, despite everything you said, if it's entirely true, m my expectation is anyone who's decided to vote for Trump won't give a fuck. <laughs> anyone who's voting for K Kamala will give a fuck. And vice versa, and I everything. Think the other a, way. I think there's surprisingly a lot more of undecided voters this time than people are giving credit we, for, and I think I think that we will see. But I, I think I think we could be surprised. I guarantee you, the comments in this is going to be a fucking shit show. I'm, you know, if <laughs> anytime, anywhere, I know you. Anyone who and, wants to come after me, you're going to go in there and reply to every one of them, uh, Mike. It's very interesting conversation. Um, I uh, br bring on bring on the bullshit that's going to come with this. I think it's really important to talk about these things, and at least this was good. I, I, I like that it got. I like that. I like that it was. That was good. It was, but but but, uh, but it's really good to get into the details of this because I think so many people out there are, are, are selling their souls because winning is more important than the outcome. Winning their their team winning is yeah, more politics of power. Politics of power. And I think that's where we are. And I'm I'm glad you framed it for me because I now understand what's going on. I appreciate you. I'm gonna go and listen to some JD Vance on the way back to my hotel. <laughs> and uh and then 
get the fuck out of America because I've got to go home. Bye, Brock. Thank you very much. I'll come see you. Thank you to everyone for listening.